The fate of the world is at stake. The terrifying Majin Buu was on a rampage, and it seemed like no one could stop him. With the arrival of the newly awakened Gohan, it seemed as if the day was saved. Yet, his cockiness got the better of him, and Majin Buu absorbed Gotenks and Piccolo. With seemingly no hope, Gohan wallows in despair. But with this despair, a raging beast is unleashed from its chains. The battles against Super Buu have been extremely difficult, as Gotenks and Piccolo are absorbed. All hope seems lost, as Gohan's cockiness gets the better of him. Even once Goku arrived with the Potara, Gohan was in trouble, as he failed to catch the earring. While Gohan looked for the Potara, one part of Buu's body snuck behind him to try and absorb him. But Goku burst into Super Saiyan 3 quickly and kicks Gohan out of the way in his last breath. Goku asks Gohan to let it all out, and finally save Earth, as Super Buu absorbs Goku, gaining his clothing. Electricity sparking around him in his Super Saiyan 3-like state. Once again, Gohan was blinded by his confidence, by his power. He'd not only let his father, who sacrificed himself for him years ago, be absorbed, but also little Goten who he, as an older brother, had a responsibility to protect. He'd failed his family, his master Piccolo, and now he was all alone, without a brother, without parents, without his mentor. He was all alone, and it was his fault. Gohan could feel it once again. A new power awakened by rage. By the beast inside him, this was an era of high jumps in power. Goku with his Super Saiyan 3, Goten and Trunks fusing, Buu with his absorptions, Gohan broke the standard. Buu could absorb all the people in the planet he wanted, and even then, he wouldn't be able to touch Gohan in this new unknown stage. Gohan felt it, his third chance. After failing against Cell and now against Boo, he wouldn't let his confidence go over to his head. This was his final opportunity to prove himself, and he would do it. Gohan instantly kicks Boo. The kick was so hard that Boo was sent flying away towards space, with his stomach crumbling. Not only was he badly hurt, his mind couldn't even process what happened because of how fast everything went through. But that didn't matter because Gohan was already throwing a Kamehameha towards him, putting all of his energy into that single beam, remembering his father, placing his hand over his. Last time he fired one. He may not have been there in physicality, but his spirit was always with him. Gohan couldn't waste a single second, not anymore. He could feel the energy waving through his arms, towards his hands. The intensity of the attack and boo. Who was feeling it in every single atom in his body, being disintegrated little by little until nothing was left. Gohan watched the sky, now purified of this monster. He finally did it. He saved Earth with his own two hands. It was over. And thus, Vegeta soon arrived, accompanied by Uranai Baba. He had been brought back for a single day in order to help in the battles against Buu, but it was clear that he was no longer needed. Gohan turned to look at Vegeta, who was completely in awe by this power. Baba said that if Vegeta wasn't needed anymore, then it was time to return to Otherworld. But Gohan stopped them. They still needed to do one final thing. Use the Dragon Balls to revive everyone. Vegeta nodded at Gohan, and thus, alongside Dende and Mr. Satan, they summoned the dragon, reviving everyone killed by Buu, and surprisingly, even good Buu himself. This confused everyone. Before someone tried to attack him, Mr. Satan stepped in the way and protested, saying that he wasn't a threat. Gohan also pointed out that Vegeta was brought back. It looks like his willingness to fight against Buu was enough to convince King Yama that he was a good guy once again. After everything was fixed, 
Gohan starts to train this new power. Everyone is in shock because of how ahead Gohan is. It's one of the biggest jumps in power they've ever felt. Gohan himself has issues trying to train this power. He's the strongest of them all, so he starts to think that he doesn't need to train. But Goku and the rest argue otherwise. In particular, Piccolo tells him that he needs to gain true control over this new form. He manages to balance his studies and his training, but still, he's so ahead that he has issues trying to train. He doesn't have anyone close to him strong enough to contend with him. Forms like Super Saiyan 3 in both his father and Gotenks are something way below him at this point. This new power is strange for Gohan, however. So, as much as he feels he will never need to train for power again, he does need to in order to gain control. Goku does want to help his son, be it as it might he can't keep up, no matter what he tries. Eventually, he thinks of something, the bright idea of teaching Vegeta the fusion dance, so they can try to fight Gohan on a more equal level. Vegeta obviously refuses, but after much convincing, he's able to accept, even though he recognizes that Gohan was on a whole nother level, and was curious to see his full strength. And so, they train at the time chamber, to perfect the dance. After a few hours, they step out and head towards Goku's home to get Gohan. Gohan is a bit annoyed, as he has exams the next day, but Goku insists on getting their weekly training done. Gohan sighs and agrees, transforming into his ultimate state, but Goku tells Gohan that he can go further for now. They have something in store. Gohan is surprised but agrees, bursting into beast. Gohan smirks, allowing his power to give him a more cocky attitude. He tells them both to come at him, but Goku and Vegeta simply smirk, getting into their positions, surprising Gohan as Gogeta appears at the battle scene. Gogeta begins this intense battle in base, where Gohan is able to keep up with the fusion easily, but that isn't the full length of his capabilities, quickly bursting not only into Super Saiyan, but into Super Saiyan 3. This finally causes Gohan to begin struggling, being forced to get better control of his power over time. Gogeta Super Saiyan 3 fights Gohan Beast, and even though Gohan's still ahead, Gogeta has both the experience and techniques of both Goku and Vegeta, giving him a great battle. The battle culminates in a final beam struggle with a Kamehameha from Gohan and a Big Bang Kamehameha from Gogeta, where Gohan finally pushes the blast back and explodes in the middle. Gohan smiles, nearly dropping out of Beast and holding his arm, but Gogeta appeared behind him and kicked him away into a mountain. As the smoke cleared, Gogeta stood tall, smirking and giving Gohan a hand up. That Kamehameha was impressive, but it wasn't enough. Gohan needs a lot more training in order to control his power properly. Gohan promises to continue training, thinking about what Piccolo could be up to. He'd love to train with him again. Gohan grows exponentially in strength thanks to his training, and the Gogeta he fought is slowly being eclipsed by his power again, though Goku and Vegeta also train trying to somehow find a way to keep up with Gohan. Piccolo still has a lot to teach Gohan, and Gohan can now teach things to Piccolo, so the two of them grow stronger over time. Thus, some time passes, Gohan marries Videl, and even joins in training against them a few times. She makes sure that Gohan doesn't get complacent, she knows how he is, if he thinks his power is enough, he'll stop training, but that's what he has Videl and Piccolo for. Piccolo himself grows increasingly in power, surprising everyone, to the point where he slowly gets close to keeping up with Goku and Vegeta. During Battle of Gods, Beerus faces Goku and everything seems to go as the same. When Beerus goes crazy after pudding, Gohan tries to stop him in his ultimate form, but fails, but surprises Beerus with the power of Gohan Beast. Could this be the power of the Super Saiyan God he was looking for? As Beerus starts to get more excited and unleashes more and more power, Gohan starts to get sloppier. Considering he couldn't feel Beerus' key, he had a huge disadvantage regarding knowing his opponent's next move and whereabouts when fighting at such great speeds. Gohan was looking confused at his surroundings, being attacked and blocked just to be attacked again. Beerus was so fast, he was like a blur. Gohan couldn't see where he was. Eventually, Gohan was simply turned into a punching bag, not being able to defend anymore. Beerus grabbed him by the head and asked, What's the matter? I was starting to have fun. Don't back down now. Goku finally made his entrance, yelling at Beerus to stop, and when he calms down, 
but Gohan put out his hand, telling Goku to stop. This is his battle. He wants to defend Earth. Beerus cocked an eyebrow. This kid had a lot of spirit, and his strength was incredible. Clearly, he just needed to learn more to be able to keep up with him. The two continued to battle for a little while, with Gohan finally getting enraged enough to land a clean blow in the stomach to Beerus, throwing him down into the ocean and firing a huge Kamehameha. Beerus actually bled a little. He cleaned some blood off of his chin and smiled. Even if this wasn't the Super Saiyan God, this kid was worth looking into. But he was interested in what this Goku guy had to say. He did bring up something about a set of Dragon Balls. Gross, Beerus thought to himself, unless he meant the Namekian wish-granting orbs. Ah, that must be it. They both agreed that Gohan was not the Super Saiyan God, if he doesn't have any God Key with him. Beerus lets go of Gohan, who fell towards the ground, but was caught by Goku. You did very well, son. I'm proud of you. Goku plays Gohan softly on the ground while he was catching his breath. This was easily the hardest battle of his life, and he needed to recover a little. Dende healed him. The ritual goes on as usual. Goku has Shenron, Videl reveals she's pregnant, etc. Gohan is the one suggested to become the Super Saiyan God, but he says that he'd prefer to train this form for the time being. He's decided that he wants to continue evolving as a human, rather than a Saiyan for now. So Goku becomes the Super Saiyan God. As Goku and Beerus start their match, they both realize that Goku is definitely weaker than Gohan Beast, but he's still able to give Beerus a good fight, considering he can sense his energy and he has a lot more experience with martial arts, movements, and strategies. At the end, Beerus ends up very pleased with these two warriors and offers both of them to train on his planet. Goku accepts, but Gohan says that he'll go there from time to time, not doing a full-on training for the time being. He has to focus as his soon-to-be daughter Pan is on her way, and he has a lot of studies. So Vegeta joins in Goku after convincing Whis to train with some instant noodles. Unknowing to all of them, however, as Vegeta and Goku train together with Whis, Frieza's forces gathered on Earth, collecting the Dragon Balls and wishing for their Emperor to be brought back. Frieza, when he was brought back, remembered the man who killed him, that Super Saiyan. Then he remembered Goku, Vegeta, and finally Gohan, all of those pesky Saiyans. He would finally put an end to the race, leaving planet Earth to train for some time. The birth of Golden Frieza is at hand, but the beast remains on Earth to protect it. Next, what if Gohan would be Sterling? Hey kids, don't go away. We'll be right back. Hello everyone, I hope you're enjoying the video thus far. If you like this sort of content and want to see more and support the channel, then consider becoming a Patreon. There, you can help support the channel through various tiers while getting some perks of your own. As a Patreon, you will help get the videos out faster, fun thumbnail art, editing, and even writing for videos. Overall, this is the best way we can ensure to keep providing you guys with awesome content. Plus, you get some neat perks like a bonus mini podcast, early access to videos such as this one, and more. So be sure to go to patreon.com slash smugstick and consider supporting the channel. Anyway, let's get back to the video. And now back to our show. Some time has passed ever since Beerus, the god of destruction, arrived on Earth. Now, Frieza's army sets its sights on the Blue Planet, as some of his remaining forces have revived the Emperor in order to bring down the Saiyans and kill Goku once and for all. Gohan led the charge, taking out most of the army by himself. He had his potential unleash power fresh as ever, and he faced the Emperor himself after taking out Shizame and Tagoma. Gohan declared himself as being the one to stop Frieza once and for all. Yet, Frieza didn't recognize him at first. I wouldn't get overconfident if I were you. The real battle hasn't even started yet! <laughs> it's Frieza! A common stranger knows my name. I see that my illustrious reputation precedes me. You don't recognize me, but I'm no stranger. I fought with you on Namek years ago. What's that? Uh, you're that little brat, aren't you? I see that you've forgotten my name. Allow me to remind you. I am son of Goku, guardian of all that is good, Gohan. I'd love to kill Goku, but killing his son is the next best thing. <laughs> 
Yeah? Well, you'll never know. Gohan rushed towards Frieza and punched him in the gut so hard that it could have killed him instantly if it wasn't for Frieza transforming into his final state at the very last second just to tank the attack. It still hurt. It hurt so much. This was way too much power for a guy who wasn't even a Super Saiyan. Frieza knew something was up and returned the punch. Gohan was quickly humbled, realizing that he too had gotten much stronger since the last time they fought. Both of them started fighting. They were on equal footing. Gohan was able to develop more of his hidden potential lately, so he was even stronger than when he was just in his ultimate power. Frieza was getting angry with each passing second. He came looking for revenge on Goku and he was being held back by his son. It didn't matter. This whelp would know the true fear soon. Frieza kicked Gohan to the other side of the island to make some space. As he started to raise his energy, an explosion of power was seen and when the dust settled, Frieza revealed his new state, Golden Frieza. But instead of cowering in fear like Frieza had expected, Gohan just smirked. This was going to be fun. Gohan screamed as the roar of Anuzaru echoed through the land, unleashing the beast inside. Frieza started to sweat. The roar of that filthy Saiyan was actually making him scared? No, it couldn't be. Frieza damned the world. Why was this brat hiding so much power this whole time? What came next was a humiliating beatdown. Every punch Frieza threw, Gohan blocked and countered at speeds he couldn't even comprehend. As Frieza became more and more frustrated, Gohan became more assured of his victory. After a few failed strikes, Frieza was able to land a clean hit on Gohan's face, but he didn't even flinch. It was at this moment that he knew it. He screwed up. Frieza was in complete shock. He couldn't let it end like this. Even when Frieza tried to blow up the planet, Gohan had learned by now when to stop playing games and get serious. With a full power Masenko, Frieza was simply no more. That was payback for all the misery Frieza caused on Namek. Gohan was surprised by hearing Goku's applause. He'd been watching from the moment Frieza turned golden, interested in seeing how Gohan would deal with this threat, and he was not disappointed. Goku was growing prouder by the day. Vegeta coughed loudly, proclaiming that he wouldn't allow Kakarot nor Gohan to surpass him for long. He would reclaim his position on the top. Gohan chuckled nervously. He had made two rivals without even realizing it. He couldn't afford to slack off in his training anytime soon. And so, Frieza found himself once again in his personal hell, surrounded not only by little angels and teddy bears, but also little superheroes that reminded him a lot of Gohan. Some more time passes, and Gohan continued his studies and lectures as a scholar with vigor. The time he spent with Videl and Pan increased, as they were precious to Gohan. This was the life he wanted, but despite his adoration for his job and his family, he never forgot to stop training, with Piccolo by his side as his training coach. Gohan could feel himself become stronger every passing day. Gohan and Piccolo had a hard Heart to heart. One late night after training, Gohan knew that this beast form could get out of control. He always held back at least a little bit. He had gotten much stronger since the time he fought Gogeta, and even though they seemed close enough in power, he couldn't beat him then. Goku and Vegeta were quickly catching up, and even though Gohan was leagues ahead, he had to make sure he didn't become complacent. But this form was hard to master. He still didn't know much about it. He assumed that perhaps it had to do with him having his potential unlocked by so many beings. The Grand Elder, the Old Kai. Not only that, but he was half Saiyan and half human. He had been trained by so many people, and his power touched by so many others, that surely that was the reason he was able to obtain this form. Gohan looked over to Piccolo. I have to continue training. I need to master this beast form. And I'll be here helping you master it. Someday I too will obtain a power like that. With that resolve, Piccolo and Gohan agreed. They would continue getting stronger, continue to motivate each other, and motivate Vegeta and Goku to get stronger. They both knew that at least Goku didn't see himself as some form of hero. But as Piccolo watched Gohan fight, he knew that was a hero. Gohan fought for others. Gohan fought for Earth. He would do anything to save someone. He had come a long way since that young boy long ago. This strength would soon be needed, as one day Goku teleported into Gohan's university office as he was preparing his documents for an important upcoming conference. Gohan greets his father and asks if everything is alright, as Goku places his hands together. In a bowing motion, Goku begs Gohan to participate in a tournament between Universe 6 and Universe 
7. Gohan doesn't quite know what to say, but the moment Goku mentions that Earth would switch places into Universe 6, then he immediately accepts. If the fate of the world's at stake, he wouldn't hesitate to fight. But then again, what would be the difference between living in Universe 6 and 7? Regardless, he liked Beerus, so he'd rather stay here. Gohan sends an email to cancel his appearance at the conference due to a family emergency. He didn't like lying, but technically this wasn't a complete lie. This really was an emergency. Besides, he could make it up to the university later anyways. He had a report about a new species of ants that he believed could revolutionize the world of entomology, something akin to a Super Saiyan. With Gohan on the team, Beerus never sees the need to recruit Monaka. They already had a strong warrior to motivate Goku and Vegeta anyways, and his name was Gohan. As the tournament commences, Gohan makes sure to pay close attention to the fighters of Universe 6. This was a great opportunity to see a brand new fighting style that he had never seen before. Gohan watches on and analyzes each of the fights. Botomo's damage nullifying body, Frost cunning tricks, Magetta's iron tight defenses, Kaba's Saiyan resolve, and more importantly, hits time stop ability. Gohan absorbs every minute detail of the fights as he prepares for his own battle. During the battles between his father and Hit, Goku seems to be on the ropes as Hit's time stop continues to advance. Goku is forced to reveal his final trump card, something he had been saving not for Beerus, but for his rematch with Gohan. Gohan gasps as he sees the crimson aura he hadn't seen since he was a child. This was the Kaioken. As the battle intensifies, it seems like Goku is about to win. However, the strain of the Kaioken on his body is way too much, and he collapses onto the stage in a painful groan as Goku forfeits the match. Beerus reprimands Goku for giving up, but the Saiyan merely grins. He mentions that he believes with all his heart that Gohan can win. With this affirmation, Gohan walks up to the stage. Hit questions Gohan on if he can provide a satisfying match like Goku could. Gohan nods as his aura sparkles, Hit's eyes widen as Gohan unleashes his beast mode once again. I'm not here to fight you, Hit. I'm here to win. Nothing more, nothing less. Hit sees the anger in Gohan's eyes as he panics for the first time in a thousand years. He attempts to use his time stop, but it's already too late. In a dazzling flash that not even Jack could perceive, Gohan appeared in front of Hit and uppercuts him square in the jaw. With his new and improved soaring dragon strike, Hit, the greatest assassin in Universe 6, is nearly knocked out of the ring. However, he catches himself right on the edge, utilizing his time stop as he watches Gohan. Gohan approaches him, but to his surprise, he sees Gohan's eyes move alongside Hit, perceiving the time stop itself. Hit is completely flabbergasted and thrown off his rhythm to the point where Gohan can simply smash him across the face and out of the ring. With that final strike, Universe 7 wins the tournament. Gohan offers his hand to Hit, who accepts this gesture with a smile on his face. Gohan helps the assassin get back on his feet as he mentions how he's learned so much today. After becoming the greatest assassin in his universe, Hit had grown complacent. He saw no need to get any better, but now he was faced with the bitter reality that twice in one day, Goku and Gohan were both able to surpass him to some degree, a wake-up call that was sorely needed for him. Gohan and Goku smile back, excited to hear about Hit's new resolve. Yet, to himself, Gohan wonders if he could have turned out like Hit one day. Would he have become complacent with his strength like Hit had? Piccolo appeared before Gohan, and, as if he had read his mind, reassured him that he would never allow allow Gohan to go lazy. When they get back home, they're going to continue training ASAP. Gohan laughs, delighted to know that he has wonderful friends and family supporting him no matter what. The rest of the Universe 6 tournament goes on similarly to what happened in canon, as Zeno appears and befriends Goku, declaring that he would love to see another tournament again. Beerus uses the Super Dragon Balls to restore Universe 6's Earth to its former glory, and each team returns to their respective universes. After the tournament, Goten and Trunks continue to ask Gohan to show them his beast state. They hadn't seen it too much. And though Gohan complied, the kids were both frustrated that they couldn't get to that state. He was so scary looking. Goten promised himself he'd obtain that ugly muck one day. However, not everything is as it seemed. As 
from far away. In Universe 10, a certain Kaioshin in training had watched the tournament from God 2. His name was Zamazu, and he was absolutely livid. How could there be mere mortals who were using these powers of the gods for their own selfish desires? And beyond that, there was even a mortal who seemed to exceed the gods. Zamazu rewatches Gohan strike against Hit over and over again, astonished by the absurd strength this mortal's body could contain. Son Goku's crimes were far more egregious, but this man was just too powerful. He had to have him. He needed his body. And so, Zamazu prepares his plan with Gohan at the center of it. Yes, Son Gohan would be the cornerstone for his Zero Mortals plan. One day, a time machine arrives at Capsule Corp. It was Future Trunks. He had come back to the past, and he was gravely injured. Unconscious, he was attended to by Bulma, Goku, and Vegeta. When he woke up, he locked eyes with Goku and... smiled. Trunks let out a sigh of relief. He made it. He made it to the present. He greeted everyone, apologizing for the scene he caused. But he needed help once again. A new threat has risen from the future. It was... Gohan. Trunks explains that sometime after dealing with Bobbity and Dabra, an unknown being made his presence known by annihilating cities in the middle of the reconstruction. When Trunks went to face him, he couldn't believe his eyes. It was his master, he'd come back! He was alive, but he was destroying everything in his path. Nothing made sense. This couldn't be his master seeking revenge from beyond the grave, could it be? They fought for months, but Trunks was never able to stop him. Not only was he weaker, but he felt guilt and confusion behind every attack he threw, holding him back. Everyone was shocked, and they didn't know what to think of it, but they assured him they would help him. Moments later, in a rift in the sky, Gohan Black made his entrance known. Nothing changed much from here. Goku is the first one to fight him as a Super Saiyan 2. Gohan Black boasts of his strength before returning to the future, and Whis and Beerus get suspicious of this key signature. Could it be? Before the gods could finish their thoughts, Gohan arrived at the scene, wanting to know what those weird key signatures he was feeling were. He wanted to come sooner, but he had to finish the presentation. Trunks sees him, and his heart skips a beat for a second, thinking he may be Gohan Black, but no, his eyes were far too gentle for that monster. This was the Gohan he remembered fighting side by side with all those years ago. Both of them are happy to see each other, and they start to catch up over some ice cream. Gohan can't believe what he's being told. An evil version of himself? There had to be a reasonable explanation for this. Whis and Beerus ask him if he wants to join in on a trip to another universe to gather a few clues. Gohan said that he had to take care of Pan after work, but Piccolo, who was there watching the entire battle with Black, said that he had him covered. He should go for it, and show that imposter what a real fighter looks like. With confidence, Gohan accepts. Goku wanted to join in too, but Beerus told him it was none of his business. In the best case scenario, his buffoonery would slow them down. Gohan, Beerus, and Whis travel to Universe 10, meeting the universe's Supreme Kai, Gowazu, and his apprentice, Zamazu. Zamazu's heart was beating fast. This was the mortal he saw online. Gohan respectfully addresses his god position, greeting him as His Highness. Zamazu felt flattered and calmed down a little. We, we came here to investigate a situation back home that threatens my world's safety. Safety? Don't you mortals only seek destruction and despair? Not all of us. Some do seek to conquer and destroy, but others, like me, my father, we want our world to be safe. Samazu is a little impressed by this mortal's tact and courtesy, but he brushes it off for the time being. After talking to Gowazu, Beerus suggests that both of them should spar. That's how they would get the info they needed for their little inconvenience back home. Gohan and Zamazu fight, and he's impressed by the god's power. Zamazu would definitely be able to give Cell a run for his money. However, as the battle intensifies, Gohan can start to feel the same malignant key he felt resonating from Black. Beerus and Whis also feel it, and the battle stops in a draw. Gohan held back and didn't want to use more power than necessary. He just needed to test Zamazu's energy, and he thanked the god for his time. Zamazu asked why Gohan didn't use his white hair form, which surprised the Saiyan. How did Zamazu know about the beast mode? Gohan mentioned that he only used it when it was necessary. As Zamazu was about to feel insulted, Gohan added that it was mostly in emergencies, to protect Earth, his home. Zamazu argued that he saw him using it in the Universe 6 tournament, but Gohan retorted saying that the fate of Earth was at stake. If they were to lose the tournament, the Earth would have changed to a different universe, with unknown threats. Zamazu pondered this for a while, and he ultimately understood. 
Once again, Zamasu feels like the mortal respects his divine position, and th this thought stays in Zamasu's mind. Once back home, Beers and Whis decide to relax with some much needed food or some racing games if you read the manga. Gohan finally gets to go home and sees future trunks who came to visit. Gohan shares all the information he was able to gather from the trip, but it still wasn't enough to draw a clear picture. Who was Gohan Black? Why was he connected to Zamazu? Why was he destroying the future? It didn't matter. Once he went to the future, Gohan would beat up his doppelganger easily. Future Trunks smiled. This was the Gohan that he remembered from the Cell games. With their preparations complete, Goku, Vegeta, Gohan and Trunks finally went to the future, and Gohan made his presence known by throwing a blast into the sky. With Gohan Black's arrival, the battle was imminent. Both Gohans locked eyes with each other, neither of them wasting any time and rushing forward. Gohan unveiled his potential unleashed form, and he was giving Black quite a beating. Gohan Black hadn't had enough time to access his body's full power yet, so he was at a severe disadvantage. However, as Gohan kept hurting Gohan Black, he could feel his power increasing. Every punch, every kick that connected. Gohan Black was getting injured, but this was just making him stronger. The second Gohan realized they were equal now, he elevated his power into Beast, throwing a key ball to end it all. But Gohan Black was standing on the ground still, pushing it, getting stronger, and the mere touch of Gohan's key. As a maniacal laugh echoed through the destroyed city, Gohan's key ball imploded. And as the dust settled, everyone's nightmare came true. Gohan Black Beast is born. Gohan is frozen. He doesn't even know what to do, and the power he's feeling greatly surpasses his own. Thanks to Gohan Black Beast's divine key, enhancing his strength, it was the first time in a long time that he felt someone surpass him. All this time he had felt invincible, but now he had a very dangerous threat in front of him. He was feeling the fear of death cover every inch of his body once again. Gohan quickly recollected himself. He was the only one who could stop this menace as he rushes towards Black. He did the same, and they both clashed. But it was obvious who had the advantage here. Gohan was putting all he had into the attacks, but Gohan Black was still smirking, smiling, nearly laughing, while blocking and countering. Gohan knew the only chance he had to win was to use his rage. That was always the solution, wasn't it? Against Cell, against Boo, his rage was always key, so he was forcing himself into this state of pure rage. Yet, that was barely helping. He was becoming reckless, more impulsive, predictable, but Gohan Black maintained focus. After a few careless movements, Gohan Black was able to strike Gohan enough to leave him on the floor, exhausted and beaten. Goku and Vegeta turned into Super Saiyan Blue and launched a combined beam towards Gohan Black Beast, but he was stopped with a single hand. He reigned supreme now. By pushing his hand further, Gohan Black destroyed the beam, and before Goku and Vegeta could realize what happened, they were struck down on the ground. Future Trunks jumped towards Gohan Black, sword in hand, but he simply burst his aura open. This was enough to leave Trunks on the floor as well. With all of them incapacitated, a single Kai descended down from the sky, and Gohan couldn't believe his eyes. It was Zamazu. He was Gohan Black's ally. Gohan yelled at Zamazu, asking what he did to this place, but this Zamazu was far too gone. He mentioned how he was going to purge the world of all mortals that threatened to destroy it. Gohan called him out on his hypocrisy, telling him that he was destroying it. But he was interrupted by another attack from Black. It took the resistance, intervention, and a few smoke grenades to save them. But Gohan Black didn't care that much, he felt unstoppable. Once the warriors felt safe, they started to discuss how to stop Gohan Black. Goku brings up the idea of fusing again, but Vegeta dismisses it. He doubted it would be enough. There had to be another way. They agree that they need to come back to the past to make a new strategy, so they do so, while making a distraction with the help of the Resistance. The four Saiyans are able to escape to the present through the time machine. Gohan suggests Trunks go train with the Kais, so the Elder Supreme Kai can unleash his potential. Not only would that give him an insane amount of power, but it will give him the possibility of awakening the same state he and Gohan Black had. 
With no more time to waste, Trunks is taken to the world of the Kais, grateful to meet Shen once again. Although this is the first time that present Shen meets future Trunks, it's a nice introduction regardless. He also meets the old Kai and starts the ritual to unleash his potential. The old Kaioshin jokes that he'd need a picture of a pretty lady to go with the plan, and he looks at Gohan with a wink, but the man wasn't willing to play any games this time. They needed his help urgently. Goku and Vegeta decide to enter the time chamber once more. They need to find a way to break their limits. If they want to be useful in this fight against Gohan Black, they would have to close the gap in power one way or the other. With these new findings, Gohan joins Beerus and Whis once again in Universe 10, gathering further evidence to stop Zamazu once and for all. However, Gohan interjects. He feels that this Zamazu isn't too far gone just yet. He felt it, the difference between present and future god. So he wanted to see if he could bring Zamazu back from the dark. As they arrive, they are all greeted once again. Gowaz is confused with what's going on, but Gohan instantly goes in and interrogates Zamazu about his thoughts and his morals. Zamazu is speechless. He knows that what he's about to say won't be welcomed in the best ways by his master, but oh well. Gohan asked. Zamazu mentions that he saw how barbaric and destructive mortals could be in his own universe, how they never change no matter how much time passes. Brutality and violence was in their nature, that this was the universal constant amongst mortals that could never be tamed. But Gohan argues that things are different back in his universe. Like he said before, there are people that seek to conquer and destroy, but he and most people he knows fight to better themselves and protect those around them. Most mortals just want to live in peace. He also mentions how he saw destructive people come back from the darkness. He recalls Vegeta, who was a cruel Saiyan conqueror when they first met, and how he ended up being a father and one of Earth's greatest protectors. Zamazu is in disbelief. Could this be true? It was surely a lie, but Gohan reaffirms that this is the truth. With Goku, Zamazu would have disregarded that childish mortal, but Gohan, he was respectful, intelligent, he knew his place, and Zamazu appreciated that. This Gohan was definitely far different from the barbarians he had seen. He respected Gohan enough to listen to what he had to say. After saying goodbye once again, Gohan, Beerus, and Whis went to space to see what Zamazu was about to do next. They still had their doubts about him. They saw Zamazu about to strike Gowazu with a keyblade, but he lowered his hand. Zamazu was looking at himself, at his hand, doubtful, conflicted. Finally, he just sat with Gowazu once again to drink tea. Gowazu even mentions that the tea tasted better than last time, since he's in company of Zamazu. Gohan sighs. And Beerus says that they probably fixed the future, but Gohan doubts it. He hopes they did, but that's not how time travel works as far as he knows. Coming back home, and with the threat of Gohan Black Beast still present ahead, Gohan falls on Videl's arms, tired. After the beating he took, and after all the traveling, Videl asks him what's wrong, and Gohan vents in the safety of his wife's arms. I was told ever since I was a kid that my potential was the key to success that my potential was different, stronger, unreachable. But now I'm facing this guy who has my power, my potential, and Dende knows what else. I don't know what to do, Videl. I feel lost, but how can I ever hope to take this guy down? Mm, well, you do have something he doesn't. And what's that? Oh, I'll be right back. Gohan opens the door, and to his surprise, it's Piccolo. They both greet each other, and... Gohan's happy to see his old master. Piccolo asks to spar, and he wants to show him something. Gohan, curious, accepts the proposal, and they both go to the backyard, ready to train. Gohan starts in base, throwing a punch, but Piccolo easily grabs it and kicks him away. He's not there to play any games. Gohan turns into his ultimate form, and it's clear that he has the advantage. But Piccolo, in a sudden burst of energy, awakens a new state, gaining a yellow hue. Piccolo mentions that he knew he was far behind Gohan and that he really wanted to help against this new threat of Gohan Black, but he didn't know how. So, after a while of thinking, he thought of using the Dragon Balls to try and unlock this new potential, just like Elder Guru had to Gohan, and he managed to do so thanks to Dende upgrading the Dragon Balls, now even rivaling Gohan's power. The Half Saiyan is impressed, and while they keep sparring, Gohan updates Piccolo on everything that's been going on. Gohan Black's beast state, Zamazu, etc. 
After hearing that future Zamasu is immortal, Piccolo mentions that he knows how to stop him, grabbing Gohan's interest even more. He would definitely be a great asset to the team. After a while, they both stop fighting. Gohan's very happy for his master, and Piccolo's surprised to see his own strength. Their chance of winning is as high as it could be, if they fight together. Vidal walks up to the pair, with a bright smile on her face. See what I mean, Gohan? Despite everything that Faker has, it doesn't matter, because you have us. Thanks, honey. Thanks, Piccolo. I feel like we can do this. Let's go save the future. 24 hours later, Gohan visits the Kais, and Trunks shows off his potential unleash. He's even stronger than Gohan himself in that state. Gohan's amazed. They also spar for a little bit, and thinks that perhaps Trunks will be able to access that same beast state. Goku and Vegeta finally get out of the time chamber. Both of them more serious, more focused, they're prepared for battle. Before they go, Gohan grabs the great Saiyaman clothes. He's going to show Gohan Black what true justice looks like. The team is set. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, and Future Trunks join in. And instantly, they realize that there's too many people in the time machine. Piccolo thinks of something. Looking at Goku and Vegeta, Goku and Vegeta raise an eyebrow. What was he planning? The time machine finally lands in the future. And inside it, there's only Gohan, Trunks, and Piccolo, who had a little bottle in their hands. Gohan Black and Future Zamasu instantly intercept them, laughing at the mere sight of the Namekian. What was he supposed to do? Help them surrender? And did Goku and Vegeta already give up? It seems like they know when their future is lost. Piccolo smirks, throwing the bottle into the ground as it breaks. In a bright red and blue light, Goku and Vegeta make their appearance, instantly rushing towards Gohan Black, revealing their new states. Kaioken times 20 and Blue Evolution. Goku spent way too much time trying to perfect the Kaioken, the key to closing the power gap. Vegeta constantly battling Goku in this powered up state was able to break through his own limits and unlock this new evolved state. Both of them land a combined punch in Gohan Black's gut, leaving him almost out of breath. But was this enough? The three start to ferociously fight, with Gohan joining in while Trunks and Piccolo focus on Zamasu. Ultimate Piccolo and Ultimate Trunks attack Zamasu with all they have, but it's pointless. He's immortal. Nothing they do will ever stop the power of this god. Piccolo says that they'll see about that, as Piccolo grabs another bottle and screams out, Evil Containment Wave! Zamasu smirks, thinking that it's just another beam attack, but his smile quickly turns into an expression of horror as he starts to be sent into the bottle. Gohan Black was on the ground, he was losing pretty quickly. Goku and Vegeta together were an issue, but with Gohan supporting them, it was a losing battle. These mortals, how did they get so strong? As Gohan Black started to lose his ground, quicker and quicker, he saw his comrade disappear from existence. What did they do? Piccolo said that he used the evil containment wave, especially made for this immortal being, and he sealed Zamasu away forever. Unlike Goku, he didn't forget to bring the seal into the future. Gohan Black lost all hope, falling to his knees, his plan in shambles, and his anger building up. A feral scream was heard through the city, destroying what was left of the buildings. This is what Zamasu needed to awaken true power of his beast state, rage, anger, wrath. Piccolo and Future Trunks joined in the fight, only all of them fighting together could match Gohan Black now. The six of them staggered, and they were using their experience and their bond through time to handle this threat. Piccolo maneuvered with Gohan, while he's maneuvering with Trunks. He's himself fighting alongside Vegeta, who's supporting Goku. They all landed a long combo on Gohan Black, who was getting desperate. Gohan understood now that he didn't have to fight alone. Up until this point, he thought that it was his job to handle threats like this, being the strongest after all. But his close friends, father and mentor by his side, and the rest of the warriors were truly unstoppable. Gohan Black's anger is at its peak. With that, he makes a scythe out of his power, slashing reality itself, sending clones. The clones start to push back the fighters, as Gohan Black rushes towards Zamasu's bottle. But Gohan intercepts him at the last second, both starting a new battle far away from the gang. Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks were able to maneuver around the clones, but they were having a hard time doing so, and Piccolo was starting to become a punching bag for them. He was losing ground by the seconds, and even though Trunks wanted to get closer and help him, there were too many of them, stopping him from intervening. As Piccolo's vision blurs, he recalls what Shenron mentioned when he made the wish to get his power unleashed. He didn't just unlock his potential, he gave him a little extra. He gave him something else.
Piccolo elongates his arms, using them like a whip to eliminate hundreds of clones. Everyone was in shock, but they had to quickly recollect themselves to keep fighting. Goku starts to feel weaker after the Kaioken, but Vegeta doesn't back down. He starts to punch the clones with his key infused hands, turning them blue and dissipating them. He yells at Trunks to go all out and help Gohan that he and Piccolo had this. Vegeta and Piccolo stood back to back, bursting their auras and proceeding to battle the clones. No matter what Gohan did, Gohan Black did better. Every punch, every kick was blocked and countered, and Gohan was very slowly losing his breath. In a desperate move, Gohan headbutted Gohan Black, both of them grabbing each other's arms. Gohan Black smiled as he activated his key sword once again, cutting Gohan's hand. You may know everything I'm going to do, but I know everything you're going to do. Strange, isn't it? Karma instantly striked as Trunks appeared on the scene, slashing Gohan Black's eye. The god dropped back into base for a second, and as Trunks was about to go for another slash, he watched him. That scar, it was like watching his master once again. Trunks stood frozen, and as Gohan yelled at him to move out of the way, Gohan Black kicked him in the gut so hard that it almost left him incapable of breathing. Trunks lands on the other side of the area, barely alive. His vision blurs more every second, and when he regains his sight once more, he sees himself again, powerless, unable to do anything while his master Gohan is losing a battle. It's not a fight, it's a ticking sound of a clock that ends with his death. He sees his old master, his Gohan, fighting the androids. The trick his mind played moments ago awakens his memory inside. He sees the night he fell, the rain on the ground touching his lifeless body. He knows that story will repeat itself, his sadness, guilt and rage engulfing his heart as an aura starts to explode, engulfing him in a gold and blue aura. Gohan looked at him, what was he doing? Was he trying to go Super Saiyan on top of the Unleashed State? No, this was pure rage concentrated. Gohan could feel it, he was tapping into it, he knew it. The gold and blue of Trunks' aura turned into a white and red color, expanding in power. Once the dust settled, everyone saw how Trunks awakened. His beast state. He threw his mightiest Masenko, nothing holding back anymore. While Gohan joined in, Gohan Black tried to counter with the Rose Masenko of his own, but the combined might of the beast was too much, and so he was engulfed, becoming nothing more than dust. They finally won. Goku teleported over to New Namek to use the Namekian Dragon Balls to restore the future. Since these Dragon Balls had been upgraded already, they used them to revive everyone killed by both set of villains. Future Bulma reappears with her teary eyes. She didn't doubt for a second that Trunks would be able to save them all, and without a second thought, she hugs Vegeta. Vegeta blushes and comforts her. She wasn't his Bulma, but he cared for her no matter what timeline. But he did get a little nervous when he saw another Vegeta appear. Future Vegeta, looking at them with a mean face, stepped up to them and pushed present Vegeta out of the way. Future Trunks saw how his Gohan finally returned. All the trauma, all the pain, everything could heal now. Just with that sight. Thanks for protecting the Earth, Trunks. I knew you could do it. Trunks hugs Gohan, not believing his eyes. Both Gohan's locking eyes and nodding at each other. I have so much to tell you. Everyone enjoys a nice feast. As Earth finally returns to normal, the universes return to normal. Gohan tells future Gohan everything about Pan, Videl, and the training he did, suggesting him to get his potential unlocked by the Kaioshin, and to all of them to train with the Destroyer Beerus. Or something like that. Just be a little careful with them. After all, Trunks made sure to tell Goku to revive everyone killed by the Majins in his timeline too. Both of the Vegetas talk, with future Vegeta not knowing how to feel about his present counterpart. His life, his power, jealousy, pride, didn't matter. The future was saved. Even the other fighters like Tien, Krillin, and Yamcha came back. Yajirobe teared up a little bit, being reunited with Karin. Everyone leaves, with Piccolo bringing the Zamazu bottle with him, and Gohan wishing the best for future Trunks and his timeline. Finally, they could rest. The time machine disappeared into the distance, with Gohan looking forward to their next adventure. After battling that monster known as Gohan Black Beast, Gohan realized that his power wasn't the only thing he had to work on, but also his teamwork. Without his friends, father and master, he wouldn't have been able to save the future. But aside from that, there was another interesting thing that he learned from that experience. The key constructs, the keyblade, different type of key techniques, that was something Gohan could use in the future. So shortly after returning to the present, Gohan began experimenting with key manipulation. He tested out different types of key constructs, 
figuring what worked, what didn't work, and discovering the limits of what he could use key with. Gohan made sure to write all of this down and began writing down notes for a new book, something he would name Groundbreaking Science, The Guide to Key Control. He didn't have any intentions in publishing this book. More than anything, this was for himself and to share his findings with his daughter, Pan, when she grew older. He wanted her to experience the joy of flying and so she could defend herself. No matter what happened, he wanted her to learn everything he knew. With time, Gohan was able to successfully summon a Keyblade without losing any fingers. He swung it around a bit, learning how far he could extend his range. This reminded him a lot of his time training with Piccolo and with the Sea Sword. But he didn't stop there, he continued trying to discover new ways to use his energy. Gohan was so engrossed in this research that several months passed on by without him realizing it. If it wasn't for the support of Piccolo and Videl, he probably would have forgotten to eat or take showers. It was during a visit with Piccolo, with a daily reminder to stop research and take care of his daughter for at least a while, that Goku suddenly teleported in to his study. The pair were taken aback. It was rare for Goku to come in for visits at his study. It could only mean something bad was about to happen. Sure enough, Goku begs Gohan and Piccolo for their help. It was nearly time for the Tournament of Power, and the stakes couldn't be higher. If they lose, then their entire universe will be destroyed. Piccolo is shocked to hear about this, but Gohan is absolutely livid. He nearly breaks his desk in two out of frustration, which catches Goku out of surprise. Who did Seno think he was, toying around with people's lives like this? Goku tries to calm his son down, who finally manages to take a deep breath. Gohan agrees to join in the tournament, as he wouldn't allow anyone he cares about to die. Goku and Piccolo are glad to see his resolve, as they agree to meet at Capsule Corp later that day. Gohan makes sure to spend his time wisely, training with Piccolo and even testing out their max power for a while. They have unconditional trust in each other. Gohan is glad to see old faces like Krillin, Tien, and Master Roshi again. It was unanimously decided by everyone that Gohan would be the team captain. Not only was he their strongest warrior, but he was also one of the smartest as well. His tactics and knowledge of each of his teammates would prove invaluable. Gohan thanks everyone for placing their trust in him, bowing as he promised not to let them all down. Goku suggests recruiting Frieza from Hell, but Gohan vehemently refuses. How could they even think about bringing him back? Couldn't they just go back to the future and recruit Trunks? Even with these stakes in mind, Beerus refused to allow them to mess with time ever again. In the original story, it was a discussion between the two Zenos that prompted the idea of the destruction of the universes during the Tournament of Power. But with Goku still being Goku around here, I believe that the discussion would have steered that way eventually, even if it's just with the Grand Priest. With a heavy heart, Gohan relents as he accepts Goku's request to bring back Frieza. It took a few hours, but Goku eventually returned with him, although everyone noticed that they were far more bruised and beaten than they would have expected. It was almost time for the tournament to commence, but before that, Gohan pulled Frieza aside, warning him not to play any games. He would get along with the rest of the team and help them fight for their universe, because if he didn't, Gohan would make sure to grant Frieza a fate worse than death. Frieza tries to maintain his cool and call Gohan on his bluff, but one look at his eyes were enough to let the Emperor know he wasn't joking. Given how he was easily killed earlier by Gohan when he invaded Earth, Frieza could vividly remember the intense power of that feral animal, and it shook him to his core. He tried to do mental training when he returned to Hell, creating various scenarios in which he could have possibly killed Gohan, but he couldn't. Even when he mastered his golden form, it was useless. In every scenario he envisioned, Frieza couldn't discover any way to beat him. Back in the present, Frieza starts to sweat as he promises the filthy monkey that he would never dream of betraying his allies. Gohan stares coldly at Frieza, punching him in the gut so hard that Frieza nearly blacks out. Frieza collapses to his knees, coughing up some blood, with Gohan walking away and looking back. Good, you better keep your promise, Frieza, if you know what's good for you. Goku asks Frieza if he's alright. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. Frieza looks over to Gohan, slightly panicking, 
as he reiterates that everything is fine. He just had to use the Little Emperor's room is all. Were they going to stand around gawking at him or were they going to face the tournament? They were already being transported to the world of Void. The Z Fighters scanned the rest of the competition and it quickly became apparent that, in terms of pure power, most of their enemies would be easy to deal with, except for one. Gohan could feel immense strength and heat emanating from the strongest pride trooper of Universe 11, Jiren the Grey. Gohan knew it. This guy would be a problem. But that's alright, Gohan was a scholar and a teacher and a father. Solving problems was his speciality. The tournament started with a bang, as Gohan ordered his team to stick together before bursting into his ultimate state. In the original story, the androids Goku, Vegeta and Frieza refused as they quickly split up across the area. In this story, however, everyone has deep respect for Gohan and his immense strength. Despite their desire to fight strong opponents on their own, Goku and even Vegeta listen to Gohan as they remain with their team. Frieza nearly makes a break for it, but once he hears Gohan's order to stand there or else, he immediately stops in his tracks. With the team of Universe 7 together, they make quick work of anyone foolish enough to fight them all. The Tree of the Dangerous and the rest of Universe 9 are quickly wiped out within the first few seconds, followed closely behind by Universe 10 and Universe 2. The Gods of Destruction and Supreme Kai in the stands couldn't believe what they were seeing. Their teams were being taken out so fast. Just how strong was Universe 7? Beerus grins with a satisfied look on his face, openly bragging about how fantastic his mortals were as they continued to eliminate more enemies. Gohan and Goku were glad to see Hit again, eager to see just how much he's improved since the last tournament. Hit was more than willing to unleash his ultimate technique right from the start, his Cage of Time. He attempted to trap Gohan, wagering that by sealing him away, the rest of Universe 7 would fall. However, in the blink of an eye, Gohan shattered through the Time Cage. A flash of white and purple was the last thing Hit saw before being uppercutted out of the area. After witnessing their strongest fighter eliminated so easily, Shampa orders his Saiyans, Kaulifla and Kale, to fuse together. They do so without any hesitation, creating a powerful warrior named Kefla. She challenges Gohan to a fight right off the bat, as Goku offers to take his place. Kefla isn't interested in fighting that old man, but once Goku shows off the aura of Super Saiyan God, she changes her mind. Goku proves to be more than a match for Kefla, which annoys the fusion to no end. She pulls out her ace in the hole, however, revealing that she has the Super Saiyan state. Yet, none of the Universe 7 fighters seem surprised. Goku even comments on how if regular Super Saiyan is all she got. The battle resumes, with Goku continuing to dominate the battle. In a fit of rage, Kefla powers up even further, finally learning Super Saiyan 2. Goku wonders if he should use the Kaioken Blue, but Gohan steps up to the plate. He didn't want his father to take all the glory or waste any more of his energy. This would be his fight now. Kefla questions why he isn't going Super Saiyan during the battle. Was he looking down on her? Gohan simply explains that he would never do such a thing. A long time ago, he chose to reject his Saiyan nature and focus on evolving on his human side. Yet, he now believes that he has come this far because of both human and Saiyan sides of him. Denying a part of himself would only lead to inner turmoil in his heart. Just this once, he would try to enjoy the fight like his father and Vegeta. Just this once, he would try to fight like a Saiyan. Gohan's aura erupts into that of a golden display of crackling electricity as Gohan shows off Super Saiyan 2 for the first time in many years. Gohan perks up, taking a book out of his back pocket and writing down the speech he just gave. He needed to put that in his book. This sight catches Kefla completely off guard, but for the Z Fighters, they find the form very nostalgic. Gohan mentions how he hasn't used this state in a long time, but he remembers the feeling of using it. Every time he's in this form, he feels an overwhelming urge to battle. Alright, Kefla, you wanna fight? I'll give it to you! I'll show you what an Ascended Super Saiyan really looks like! Gohan rushed down to Kefla in a flurry of blows, forcing the fusion on the defensive as he tries to figure out a counterattack. Unfortunately to her, Gohan's defenses were airtight, and he wasn't giving her a moment to breathe. As Ki Blast struck the area like lightning, Kefla fired a massive twin blast of untold power. Goku, Vegeta, and Beerus yelled at Gohan to get out of the way. Yet Gohan looked right at the attack head on, simply muttering a single word. Ka me ha me ha! 
For a moment, Gohan's eyes turn red and his hair extended outwards, shifting into ghostly white. He fires his own Kamehameha, which pushes Kefla's own blast back. Universe 6 was quickly eliminated. Jiren, who had been meditating through the tournament, finally opened his eyes. Gohan's power had caused the Titan of Justice to awaken. Jiren approached Universe 7, demanding a battle with that one with the ridiculous hair. But 17 points out that comment doesn't really narrow things down. He points to Gohan requesting to battle, but Goku walks forward, unleashing Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken. He asks to fight him first. Jiren isn't impressed, but he humors Goku, saying that he'll eliminate him quickly. It'll be a good warm-up to match up against Gohan. As Goku charges towards Jiren and Vegeta in the middle battles against Topo, the two warriors grappled each other in a contest of strength. Topo insults the prince by asking if he was content with playing second fiddle to Goku. Vegeta merely chuckles in amusement. In a moment of humility, Vegeta admits that he may be playing second fiddle in Universe 7, but he will never be weaker than Kakarot. Vegeta roars, revealing the ascended, superior evolution of Super Saiyan Blue, firing a gamma burst that shoots Topo out of the arena. When the mechanical fighters of Universe 3 unveil their fusion trump card to create Anilaza, Piccolo is ready to retaliate. He puts his hand out, requesting his teammates to stand back. He could take care of this threat by himself. Gohan isn't sure to let him at first, but Krillin reminds him that trust isn't a one-way street. If they were able to place their trust in him, then it was only fair for Gohan to place his trust in his teammates. Gohan sighs and nods with a smile, encouraging Mr. Piccolo to give it all his god. Orange Piccolo had arrived, and he was there to defeat the giant beast standing before him. Using gigantification, Piccolo grows exponentially as he reaches Anilaza's height, locking him in a one-to-one -one slugfest of titanic proportions. Many fighters were knocked aside from the colossal movements of the kaiju. Piccolo wraps his arms around Anilaza, locking him in place as he twists around with all his might. Piccolo holds his grip around him as he judo throws Anilaza directly into the abyss, eliminating Universe th from the tournament in one felt swoop. With over 30 minutes to spare, nearly every fighter had been removed from the area. Gohan orders his team to restrict Dispo's movements and prevent him from using his outstanding speed. He would assist his father against Jiren, as the Earthlings and Vegeta begrudgingly team up with Frieza against the rabbit speedster. Gohan manages to reach Goku just in time, as Jiren had finished exhausting Goku out of all his energy and throw him off the ring. Gohan grabs his father's hand before he could be eliminated. Thank you for fighting for so long, Dad. Don't worry, I'll take it from here. The two aces of Universe 7 and Universe 11 stare each other down once again. Fierce determination was blazing from Gohan's eyes. He was ready to finish this, yet Jiren is taken aback when he asked one question. How did he become so strong? Jiren ponders for a moment, deciding that he will honor this opponent's request. His actions deserve respect, he deserved an explanation. Jiren tells his story of his youth, about how his family and master were killed right before his eyes. As Jiren told this tale, Gohan couldn't help but feel immense sympathy for him. But more than that, Gohan realized that he and Jiren were a lot alike. They were both naive, innocent kids once long ago who had their childhoods taken away from them. They had a family, their master, their entire world taken from them. The only difference between the two was that Gohan had the Dragon Balls that could fix his problems and bring the lost back. Gohan wonders if without the Dragon Balls and the support of his family, he could have turned out just like Jiren, a respectful yet righteous man that valued power over anything else. Gohan shares his thoughts with Jiren as the giant stays quiet. Perhaps there is more to our connection than I initially believed. However, that changes nothing. I have absolute strength, cultivated over the course of my life through rigorous, unrelenting training. I will make you submit, Son Gohan. I'm not sure about that, Jiren. Like I said earlier, I nearly walked the same path as you, and I know what it's like to chase after absolute power. But I realize that there's only so much strength one can gain on their own. It's better to rely on teammates and friends. It's through those bonds that real strength can be found. Maybe if you had believed in this, then your universe wouldn't be on the verge of losing. Enough talk. Let's settle this. 
Face me, warrior. I'll do more than that. I'll show you the power I couldn't have reached on my own. I'll show you the power of trust, Jiren. Gohan Beast and Jiren, perhaps the strongest mortals in the multiverse, collide in an explosion of power. The clash of their fists boom in the distance like thunderclaps, mesmerizing everyone in the stands. They were locked in a contest of pure hand-to-hand -hand combat, measuring each other's strengths with precise skill. Jiren initially had the upper hand with his different techniques, like fireballs and ki barrages with his eyes, but Gohan countered with his own techniques, unveiling the fruits of his training, generating keyblades with his knuckles, which he called Beast Claws. Everyone else thought it was a little corny, but they didn't have the card to tell him. With this new weapon, Gohan was able to slash incoming fireballs and Kiais with astonishing speed and ferocity. Gohan slashed the air, creating his own volley of key based projectiles that dart directly towards Jiren. The Pride Trooper manages to avoid them all, but Gohan saw that coming, rushing in to slash his foe repeatedly from behind. Jiren couldn't believe the raw strength and savagery, yet each strike was calculated and any attempts to retaliate were met with swift movements and counters. It was like he was fighting a powerful feral animal with the mind of a martial arts genius. Perhaps it was his Saiyan instincts kicking in again, or maybe this was his human side embracing the thrill of the hunt. No matter what, Gohan was excited. No longer would he have to hold back. He was ready to unleash everything he had. The real battle had begun. At their full power, Jiren and Gohan were able to fight each other evenly as claw marks and stray blasts decimated the tournament arena. Dispo, who had been trying to evade the rest of Universe 7, is barely able to dodge the incoming blasts from Gohan and Jiren's battle, tripping in an attempt to avoid an incoming boulder, which Piccolo seizes the opportunity of. The Namekian stretches out his limbs, coiling around the rabbit like a python squeezing its prey. Piccolo yells at someone to finish this now, with Roshi, the nearest fighter, performing a mafuba that sends Dispo twisting into the sky. The turtle hermit slams him down as the fastest pride trooper is sent plummeting out of the arena. With some quick thinking, teamwork and a little luck, Dispo had been knocked out. Jiren was the final pride trooper left, while the rest of Universe 7 was still in the ring. None of the gods could comprehend this. Why was Universe 7 this strong? Beerus simply smiles, overwhelmed with an immense feeling of pride. He knew that this wasn't simply because they were strong, it was because they all trusted each other's strengths and compensated for each other's weaknesses. And at the center of it all was Gohan, their leader. His tactics and leadership were the secret behind their outstanding success. Beerus had complete confidence in their victory. As Jiren and Gohan continued their fight, Jiren seemed to be at the end of the rope. Gohan's power only seemed to soar higher and higher. Suddenly, Jiren is struck in the chest by a kick from Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta that knocks the wind out of him. He looks around in a daze, realizing that he was now surrounded by the entirety of Universe 7. Gohan tells Jiren to give up, he stands no chance of winning. Jiren's resolve wavers for the first time in years as he considers forfeiting. He was too exhausted to fight, he couldn't go on. But from this stance, Topo, Dispo, and the rest of the Pride Troopers were encouraging Jiren to keep fighting. He was their pillar, their greatest hero, their paragon of justice. They always believed in this strength. Even now, when it looks like Jiren can't continue, they believe he'll find a way to win with all their hearts. Jiren's eyes widen and he finally understands what Gohan means by trust. The sound of broken glass is heard as Gohan, Goku, and the rest of Universe 7 start to sweat. Jiren smiles, newly invigorated by the trust placed in him by his comrades and friends. Gohan knew it. Jiren had broken his limits. Gohan instructs his team to stand back and provide support while he, Goku, and Vegeta fight Jiren head on. The three Saiyans burst their key. Jiren roars as the Saiyans scream into the void, clashing with Jiren one last time. Jiren's newfound power was enough to hold back the trio, as Gohan wonders what tactic he will use. Goku yells at Gohan to stop thinking so much and keep fighting. Gohan nods, pulling out his key claws one last time. Jiren punches what's left of the arena straight down the middle, cracking it with his immense strength and sending Universe 7 into multiple directions. With a team now separated, Jiren starts to target the weaker members. Krill and Tien 
Roshi and the androids, even Frieza fell at the overwhelming might of Jiren the Grey. One by one, Universe 7's team dwindles as more seats are filled in the stands in quick succession. Beerus starts to panic as Belmont and the rest of the Pride Troopers cheer on Jiren. Gohan orders his remaining teammates to regroup, instructing Piccolo and Vegeta to provide support fire while he and his father keep Jiren occupied. They nod as Goku and Gohan jump from rock to rock, charging at Jiren with renewed fury. Piccolo and Vegeta fired multiple Ki Blast into the air, keeping them in place as they waited for their moment to strike. Goku's bright aura swirls with Gohan's purple lightning as the father and son duo unleash an onslaught of punches, kicks and slashes. The attacks were so intense, Goku broke one of his arms in the process. Despite the pain, Goku continued to fight. He couldn't let his son fight alone ever again. Jiren is barely able to defend against his unparalleled duo. As he's pushed into a corner, Piccolo and Vegeta strike. They pull their hands in as a massive minefield of key balls head straight towards Jiren. In a desperate move, Jiren attempts to push them all back with a bunch of Kiai blasts from his eyes. Yet he isn't able to stop them all and is pelted in a barrage of beams. Goku sees an opening and he attempts to charge a Kamehameha pushing back his remaining arm. Gohan, suddenly overcome with an intense sense of deja vu, knows what he has to do. Gohan yells at his father to not hold back as he cups his hands with Goku, supporting him. His father was there to support him his entire life. It was now time to support his father. Goku fires a massive Kamehameha unlike anything ever seen before. Purple electricity coats the beam as it lands on Jiren. The hero tries to hold back the beam with all his might but he knew it, he was losing ground. Gohan yells at his father to let it all out. Every last drop of ki, he has the power to win. He knows he does. Goku shouts at the top of his lungs as the roar of Anozoro is heard and Goku's eyes flash into a silver hue. Gohan shouts in unison as the two cry out a final Kamehameha resolve. The end of Jiren, the strongest warrior in Universe 11 is knocked out of the arena by the more powerful son and father, Kamehameha. Jiren could only mutter at the power of trust between Universe 7. Universe 11 is eliminated. With four contestants on the arena, Universe 7 had won the tournament of power. Goku chuckles, stammering that he actually did it before nearly collapsing. Thankfully, Gohan was there to stop the fall, pulling onto his father with an immense pride. You did it, Dad! I'm so proud of you! <laughs> nah, we did it, Gohan. All of us. Thank you so much. Gohan is quickly declared the MVP of the tournament. When Super Shenron is summoned, they make the wish with zero hesitation. Bring back the rest of the universes. The universes are restored as many people's lives are changed forever. Zamazu returns to Gowazu's planet in Universe 10, reflecting on everything he had witnessed during the tournament. The power, the kindness, the resolve exhibited by Gohan and the rest of Universe 7 moved him like something he had never felt before. He still didn't like mortals, but not nearly as much as before. Perhaps they weren't hopeless. In Universe 6, Khalifa encouraged Kale and Kaba to eat more red meat so they could become beasts as soon as possible. Hit roams the cosmos in search of strong opponents, all in an effort to further develop his time stop ability. And Jiren? The one solitary pillar of power in Universe 11 vows to cherish the bond of his teammates and train alongside them forevermore. To finally face Gohan and Goku again, we cut back to Universe 7. On Earth, as the Z Fighters return home, Frieza is brought back to life by Whis. Gohan isn't happy with the decision, but he reminds Frieza to leave Earth alone if he knows what's good for him. The Emperor simply scoffs before leaving. The Z Fighters gather around with their friends and family enjoying great food and music as everyone demands that Gohan makes a toast. Gohan is nervous at first. With the encouragement of Goku and Piccolo, he speaks up as he holds the glass. I uh, just wanted to say thank you to all of you. We've all been through a lot together and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the efforts and sacrifices of everyone around. Against demons, Saiyans, Frieza Cell, and everyone else. Time and time again, we always work together to make sure Earth is safe. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the support of each other and everyone. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you've done for us, and thank you for believing in me. 
As the crowd roars in cheers and applause, Gohan laughs nervously. Yet, all his nerves fade away when he sees two people, Videl and Pan. Gohan was overwhelmed with emotion and immediately ran over to them. Baby Pan laughs with excitement as Videl hugs her husband back, teasing him as she says that he's gotten pretty popular. Gohan apologizes, but Videl simply giggles. She looks into his eyes, saying softly that everyone here sees Gohan exactly as she does. As a superhero, Gohan smiles gently, promising her that no matter what happens, any threat that comes up next, he'll always fight to save the day. He'll never stop being her superhero. Three Saiyans share a destiny, all alongside a beast. The evil Frieza Force has returned thanks to the victory during the Tournament of Power. Two soldiers, Shiolai and Lemo, are tasked with investigating the old planet Vampa. The duo found a terrifying sight, a father and a son, Paragus and Broly. As their only way out of the planet, the father and son Saiyans beg to be taken to Frieza, meeting the Emperor who is impressed by Broly's power. Now he reveals a new plan to use that power traveling to Earth to take down Son Goku, Vegeta, and the dreadful Son Gohan. The Emperor used his soldiers to collect the Dragon Balls, catching the attention of Vegeta and Goku, who traveled to the Tundra in order to face their enemy. What they didn't expect was seeing two other Saiyans there that they had never met before. The story is similar to that of the original, though Goku and Vegeta are stronger than in the movie, meaning they give Broly more of a run for his money. In particular, Broly is forced into his berserk state early on. This changes the battle dramatically, even though Goku and Vegeta are stronger. Broly is able to adapt to this point still, and thrashes Goku and Vegeta through the snowy mountains. Super Saiyan God Goku is thrown into the ground and blasted, barely able to dodge the blast out of the way as his clothing is burned away. Panting, Goku hears someone's voice in his head. Looks like you could use some help, son. Goku covers his eyes as a bright flash of light appears before him, a cape swinging in the wind. Broly huffs and puffs at the sight of Piccolo. Could this small fry really be his next challenge? In the original tale, Piccolo mentions how he wishes he could join the fight, but he wasn't strong enough. In this tale, Orange Piccolo has enough power to contest with the mightiest of fighters, and is ready to fight alongside his friends. Goku and Vegeta watch in awe, but the only one who is truly surprised is Frieza. The Namekian was not this powerful last time they battled. Piccolo's heavy punches are a perfect match against Broly, each one shaking the tundra and causing avalanches. In the end, Piccolo pushes Broly to his limit, clearly stuck at his limit. Frieza asks Paragus if this is really everything Broly has to offer. Sadly, Paragus says yes. Frieza thinks back to the battles on Namek and how he triggered the Super Saiyan transformation from Goku. Perhaps this was the case here too. However, with both Goku and Vegeta on the sidelines, Vegeta becomes keenly aware of Frieza's actions. As he's about to fire a death beam at Paragus, Vegeta appears before the Emperor, breaking his hand as he stops the death beam. Vegeta's Super Saiyan Blue aura reflects in Paragus' eyes as his heart beats rapidly. This truly was the legend, fitting for a royal. But he had been saved. Perhaps this Prince Vegeta wasn't exactly like his father. Perhaps he had made a mistake. Frieza burst into his golden form, with Vegeta and him slamming against each other. Frieza is stronger. He had trained himself to defeat Gohan, so he was landing some serious attacks on Vegeta. But once Vegeta turned to Blue Evolution, the advantage became his. The two clashed, just like Broly and Piccolo. Goku was annoyed that he wasn't in the battle too turning to Paragus and asking if he'd like to fight too. The terrified Paragus took steps away from Goku, shaking his head. With a sigh, Goku looked around at the destruction and realized that it's perhaps time to calm things down. Paragus turned to hide behind the ship. Goku turns Super Saiyan Blue and joins Piccolo, but not to fight Broly, but to try to reason with him, saying that he doesn't have to fight anymore. Piccolo, picking up on Goku's plan, turns on the defensive, just blocking Broly's attacks, until he starts to slow down. Piccolo recognizes how similar Broly and Gohan are. That fury in those eyes, he had only seen it once before. It was a testament to how Goku had changed. It reminded him of when Goku realized Gohan was not like him during the Cell games, and tried to step in. Surely, Goku saw the same young boy within Broly, 
Broly's attacks became slower as his angry face turns into one of confusion. As he calms down, he looks over at them, without the intention to keep fighting, and falls back into his base form. With Piccolo giving him a hand up, Goku smiles and laughs, until he realizes that Vegeta and Frieza are still going at it, and surely Vegeta could kill Frieza. Goku appeared by Vegeta, telling him that Frieza's plan failed, there's no need to kill him now. After all, he's always fun to fight. Vegeta thought Kakarot was an idiot, and Gohan wouldn't like this at all. But he admitted that he didn't want to kill Frieza like this, at least not yet. A broken hand had given Vegeta a massive advantage. When he kills Frieza, he wants to do it on his own terms, when they're both equal. Frieza scoffs, taking his butt back into the ship, as Lemo, Shilai, and Paragus run out of it, and towards Broly. The Frieza soldiers didn't trust Paragus, but he really had realized the mistake he had made. He tries to explain everything. As Frieza leaves Earth, Goku laughs at the group. Broly remains quiet, asking his father if they will have to return to Vampa now. Shilai intervened, saying no, they could live together on a new planet. Goku asked if they'd like to live here, but Shilai refused to trust them, until her stomach grumbled. Goku and Vegeta brought them over to Capsule Corp, where they had a nice meal together. Finally, they agreed to remain on Earth, while Goku asked for permission to take Broly to Beerus' planet. Even during training there, Broly loses too much control when training. He can remain in control in his base form for a few minutes when sparring, but once he starts to release more power, it becomes a challenge to calm him down. So Goku gets an idea. Goku introduces Gohan to Broly, asking his son for help in teaching and training Broly to control his rage and unrivaled potential, something Gohan knows very well. Gohan thinks about it, realizing that this was the perfect time to test out what he has written in his new book, The Science of Key Control. Gohan agrees to take care of Broly. Before any training ensues, Gohan teaches Broly about life on Earth, the nature of the animals, all things that are worth saving and protecting with his power, trying to implant that into his subconsciousness. Gohan even takes Broly to Seventeen's Island. He's very fond of the animals after his experiences with Ba on Vampa. Goten and Trunks think that he's a bit of a weirdo, but his power is insanely cool. Seventeen is happy to have him around, as he reminded him a little bit of Android 16. In fact, that is exactly what Gohan used as inspiration for Broly's first few training sessions, what Android 16 taught him. Rage is a tool, it should not control you, but it's fine to let it out when necessary. As time went by, the two began to spar. Gohan's ultimate form was enough to deal with most things, but if Broly lost control, then Gohan would point out their surroundings, the trees destroyed, the craters made. This made Broly realize he was simply hurting that which he loved. The universe wasn't the target, only his opponent. Over continuous days, the training sessions went smoothly. Even Piccolo, brought by Gohan, joined in from time to time to train Broly on piercing techniques. They required such enormous key control and precision that it would definitely help him make less of a mess when blasting down his opponents. Things were great, but one fateful day, while sparring with Vegeta, Broly is pushed to his very limit. Vegeta was getting tired of always fighting Broly in base, even his wrathful form was getting boring, so he decided to teach him how to turn into a Super Saiyan, exactly the same way he taught Kaba long ago, in the Universe 6 tournament. Vegeta started to go harder in his punches, and started to scream that if Broly didn't defeat him, Paragus and him would say goodbye to Earth. They could go back to that ratness they called Vampa. Hmm, maybe he might even destroy it with them on it. Broly couldn't calm down this time, all he could see was the monster his father taught him about. Broly was trying to look at his surroundings, but Vegeta was relentless in his attacks. Goku yells at Broly to calm down, just like Gohan said, but Broly couldn't listen as he finally sees Ba, his only friend, being blasted down in his mind's eye. The memories, the isolation, the tales his father told him, it all came rushing towards him. Goku yelled at Vegeta to stop. But Vegeta looked at him and threw a thumbs up. He had already taught Kaba how to do it. There was absolutely nothing to worry about. Neither Goku, Kaioken x 20, nor Vegeta Evolution were able to contend with Broly. 
Now that he became a Super Saiyan, Goku curses. This was so fun, but if they didn't stop him soon, then the universe would surely suffer, and Beerus wasn't helping. He was eating pizza with Whis on planet Earth. This was a mess. Paragus brought up the remote control, but Goku refused to let him use it. He has to get Gohan. This is the only person who could deal with him now. So, like I was saying, this bug transforms just like a Super Saiyan. Isn't that awesome? Dad, what are you doing? I'm sorry to resort to you, Gohan, but Broly lost control. I can't stop him, even while fighting with Vegeta. I'm so sorry for always asking you to fight, Gohan. But we need you, or else the universe could be... It's okay, Dad. I'll handle this. Vegeta was barely able to keep himself together, but Gohan had finally arrived. The half Saiyan ripped his top off, revealing his battle clothes beneath and taking his glasses off. Broly! Broly left Vegeta's grasp as he looked at Gohan in the distance, who instantly unleashed his beast form, yelling at Broly to stop. Broly rushed at him instinctively and punched him with all his strength in the face. But Gohan wasn't faced, he didn't even blink. As Gohan told Broly that he didn't want to hurt him, Broly kept his rampage. But Gohan didn't move or react. He was too ahead of him right now. But then, Gohan blinked. He felt the light breeze on his face, and finally the crack on his nose, as he was finally pushed back by Broly's punches. How did he grow so fast? This was worrying, very worrying. Gohan decided to try and use the right amount of strength to knock out Broly in one punch. So he went for it. But as he was getting closer, he could feel the insane, sudden burst of strength, and when he landed the punch, he realized that not only had he failed at calming down Broly, he made him angrier. He made him stronger. Both of them clashed fists, creating enormous shockwaves around the planet. Gohan jumped backwards, and threw a Masenka with all his might towards Broly. He countered with a mouth beam, both beams clashing as they started to break reality itself apart, with their sheer power. Gohan was getting worried. What was going on? Was he destroying everything? Once both beams exploded, the reality finally shattered, consuming both of them into a black void of existence. Gohan found himself surrounded by weird bright dimensions, but he had this weird feeling that it wasn't just a realm, it was an aura. Who could it belong to? And who were all those people fighting around in the distance? He even saw some rifts that seemed to connect to other worlds. Gohan couldn't keep questioning what was going on, because Broly kicked him far away. Gohan kept yelling at Broly to stop, but he wouldn't listen. So many things happening all at once. Gohan was feeling disoriented, but his priority was to stop Broly. Both beasts clashed once again, with Gohan containing his power as much as he could, so he didn't hurt Broly too bad. He was trying to calm him down, or at least tire him, but Broly couldn't stop. Gohan jumped towards Broly, once again unleashing more power to knock him out, and punched him in the face so hard that he was sent flying away, crashing into the wall of reality. But this made him angrier once again. Broly let out a feral scream, turning his hair green and his power absolute. Gohan couldn't believe the power he was feeling. Could this be Broly's full power? Alright, it was time to stop holding back. Gohan released his full power for the first time ever since Gohan Black, matching that of Broly's. Broly rose to the sky, preparing an Omega Blaster. Gohan had to end this quickly, right here, right now. So he began to charge his strongest special beam cannon. As both of the beasts charged their attacks, 
They launched it towards each other, and Gohan's beam was strong enough to pierce Broly's attack, cutting it in half and making it explode, shattering reality once more. Before Gohan could even realize what the hell happened, they were back home once more. Gohan left a sigh of relief, letting his guard down. With this proved to be a mistake, as Broly rushed towards him, charging in with the entire weight of his body. Gohan blocked that as fast as he could with his arm, but the impact left him on the verge of breaking. Gohan screamed in pain, but he could see that Broly was too getting worn down because of the battle. He just needed that final push. Goku, in the distance, saw how his son was the grasp of the feet, even death. His anger was rising, but he knew he couldn't help if he wanted to. Could he? He remembered the form he unleashed back then in the Tournament of Power, Ultra Instinct. He was able to push his body into a silver hair variant when he launched the final Kamehameha towards Jiren. He needed that. Goku closed his eyes, trying to let go of his thoughts and worries as the silver aura started to cover him. With his left arm, Gohan started to charge a Kamehameha as Broly, whose arms were finally limp, started to charge a final mouth beam, both attacks clashing. Gohan could barely hear what was going on. His body was broken and was barely standing. He could feel the pressure on his shaking arm but he was slowly losing grip, slowly giving up. He just couldn't keep fighting anymore. But then, the weight felt lighter, much lighter. He saw how by his side, his father, Goku, was standing, supporting the Kamehameha in his Ultra Instinct state, telling him to never give up. With his renewed determination, Gohan pushed the beam as hard as he could with all that was left of his power pushing it back towards Broly, the clash imploding in a final explosion that shook Beerus' planet. But when the dust settled, Broly was finally defeated, and Gohan collapsed on the ground. Tired. Lemur and Shile ran up to Broly, worried about what happened. They had been hiding previously, but he was okay. He was alright, and that's all that mattered. He managed to calm down. Gohan then stepped towards Broly alongside Goku, helping him up and giving him a hug, telling him that they're proud of him, but he just needs to work on things a little bit more. After all, everyone has a beast inside waiting to come out, but it's up to us to use that rage for the greater good, to protect it. Broly was embarrassed and looked down to the ground, but nodded at Gohan. It was great to finally get a taste of his full power. That was one of the greatest battles either of them had ever had. And so, with Broly by their side, the team continued to train, as Gohan was getting ready to finally publish his book. He felt like Broly was the final touches he needed to complete it. His daughter was getting older, it was finally time to start teaching her. But as our faithful viewers know, the Z Fighters never rest, as there's always darkness hiding in the background. Whether it be an old wizard, or a renewed android, our heroes will never stop fighting, especially not with a beast like Gohan by their side protecting them. To be continued, next, what if Gohan went beast early? Some time has gone by since the battles between Beast Gohan and Broly. Now the world has come back to peace, as Goku, Vegeta and Broly continue to train and get stronger at Lord Beerus' planet. In order to integrate Broly into his new home on Earth, Gohan has reached out to Android 17. 17 knows better than anyone what it's like to care for Earth, something he learned from 16. 17 and Gohan both see a lot of 16 in Broly, those same kind eyes can be rarely seen in people. Broly and 17 work together as park rangers and Broly loves every second of it. Even so, it can be dangerous whenever poachers attack and Broly gets angry. Seventeen has had to save more than a few of those people he hates. Slowly but surely, his wrathful state comes under control, though it's tougher for him than even Super Saiyan. After all, no one else has this wrathful state, but there's plenty of people who can help him with Super Saiyan. His full power mode is really the issue. It's extremely powerful but so unpredictable. It reminded Goku a lot of that one Kale girl from the Tournament of Power. Gohan has been overseeing his stay on Earth. Pan loves hanging out with Uncle Broly because he is nicer than Uncle Vegeta. This actually makes Vegeta a little upset because he likes the girl. Either way, Gohan and Videl would often visit and bring her along. Broly was nervous to hold her at first, but 
with a lot of care, he realized just how cute she was. Sheila did too, and even commented on how cute it would be to have a baby one day. Broly ignored all these comments. The moral arc, as it largely focuses on Goku and Vegeta, continues as per usual. Although, since they're both stronger, it means Moro has even more power to steal from them when the time comes. So, a quick recap. Moro was freed from the Galactic Prison, later using the Dragon Balls to wish to restore his power and free the Galactic Criminals. Goku, Vegeta, and Majin Buu arrive to help out, but his key absorption abilities prove to be too much. They're left for dead. But Miras, an angel in disguise, takes Goku on to train in a hyperbolic time chamber, while Vegeta travels to Planet Yardra in order to learn of its secrets. In the meantime, Moro's forces arrive on Earth to destroy that which was most precious to Goku and Vegeta, but they don't expect to meet a beast. Goku, while training with Miras, fears that Gohan and Broly being on Earth may mean trouble, as they are the largest key sources he knows. The galactic criminals caught Piccolo and the others by surprise as 7-3, Yonba, and Shimareka arrive. Piccolo is more powerful, and so he manages to keep his power from being taken at first, and he, Gohan, and Krillin arrive to the ground and fight. Piccolo in particular uses his stretchy limbs and giant form to defeat them, but there is one being stronger with weirder abilities than most. As he transformed from his giant form and into his regular-sized orange Piccolo, something grabbed him by the neck. OG 7-3. The powerful Piccolo kicked him away, but it was too late. 7-3's color became orange as he gained all of Piccolo's abilities. Sprinting towards him, he threw a punch that rocked everything around. Piccolo was sent flying into the fight between Yunba and Gohan, which Gohan was winning. The team fired a blast at 7-3 right before he reached them. 7-3 was severely damaged, but he began to regenerate. Piccolo commented on how he had no idea he was so annoying to fight. Even so, they had this in the bag. Piccolo tells them both to not allow themselves to be grabbed. It is then when Moro informs the criminals to return to him. However, only 7-3 remains. Moro does not care if his soldiers have been killed. What he cares about is the energy they will get. Goku and Vegeta are both training, and if they give them and this Gohan guy more time, then the energy he will get will be even more delicious. Without another word, 7-3 disappears back into the portal, traveling to Moro. Gohan is confused and asks Piccolo if this is over. Piccolo shakes his head. Something tells him they'll be seeing a lot more of them soon. They must prepare. While Goku and Vegeta train, Gohan gathers the other Z fighters and the Galactic Patrol on Earth. The battle will be fierce, but Gohan ensures that he will defeat them all. Thus, the Galactic Criminals eventually arrive back on the planet. Gohan turned to look at 7-3 as he united with Sagambo. Gohan, Piccolo, and Broly stood side by side. All right, gang, ready? Let's do this! Every one of the Z Fighters burst their auras open, surrounded by a golden hue. Beast Gohan, Super Saiyan Broly, Orange Piccolo, and the rest of the Z Fighters rush forward against their adversaries. Broly wrestled Yumba to the ground, while Piccolo and 7-3 both grew in size and tried to topple each other down. The Z Fighters seemed to be winning, but 7-3 used everything he had against Piccolo, severely damaging him in the process, even using his portals to teleport behind Piccolo and grab his neck again. Piccolo fired a special beam cannon at him, and though he got his arm, it simply regenerated. Piccolo wasn't about to give up and did something crazy. He switched between giant and regular size forms to confuse and evade 7-3's attacks. 7-3 may have his powers, but not his experience. Piccolo uppercutted 7-3 as regular sized only to switch into giant form and grapple 7-3. Gohan and Broly were ready for it. Piccolo grabs 7-3, twisting him up and throwing him against the giant mountain. As 7-3 was sent flying, he saw the faint glow of Gohan and Broly. The two of them were charging a single powerful purple and green blast between them. This was the Omega Kamehameha. It is at this point where Moro enters the battle, 7-3's body laying before him as he reached out with the last bit of strength. Moro commented on how it was delightful to see that Goku has such a strong son, but if he's anything like his father, then this fight is already over. Gohan smirks, saying that he's nothing like him. For one, Goku probably went too easy on him. Moro was insulted, but before Gohan could act, Moro grabbed 7-3 and swallowed him whole. Gohan wasted no time in firing a blast at him. Moro simply opened his mouth and ate the blast. Gohan and Broly rush towards him, but they're surprised by the lava magic from the ground. Little by little, Moro begins to drain everyone's power with magic, and Gohan can't do much about it as he's forced to evade every attack, but he has to keep fighting. 
he yells at Broly to hang back, otherwise things will get worse. Gohan did something special before this invasion of Earth. Remembering his training at the Kaioshin Realm and the reveal that Majin Buu still had the Grand Kai inside him, he requested a meeting with the Kai. He wanted to train. He knew the Grand Kai was the one to trap Moro away the first time. Perhaps they could do it again. The training went well. Though Gohan didn't gain much power from it, he gained the ability to trap Moro. The Grand Kai had previously had to give up his divine power to use that technique, but Moro was so much stronger than before, it surely would take a lot more than that this time. The Grand Kai warns that it may not be enough to contain him though. He feared that Gohan will have to kill Moro. Gohan clenched his fist. He hated doing that. But if that was the only way to protect his home, then he would do it. Even so, he feared for the future of the planet. He made a request on King Kai and Whis to send out a message to allies around the universes. After all, this Gohan, unlike the one in the original story, has taken on to being this universe's protector and has made many allies along the way. He sent out a message to allies across the universes. They could use their help. He didn't know if any of them would come, or if the message would reach any of them. He could only hope. Either way, we come back to the present, as Moro and Gohan clashed, while Saigambo battled Broly. Saigambo is stronger thanks to Moro himself being stronger, and Moro powered him up. Even so, Broly completely overpowered him. Seeing Broly fight made Moro salivate, but he couldn't get away from Gohan. He continued getting some of his energy, but Gohan knew better than to let Moro get a second to breathe, so he beat him to the ground, avoiding his hand so his power couldn't be taken. The other Z fighters continued to battle and destroy the criminals, some were getting overwhelmed, and Broly could see the power being drained from life itself. For a second, it seemed like he burst into his max power state, grabbing Sagambo by the face and slamming him against the ground. Did he do it? Did he control it for a second there? He was too scared to try it out again. But at the very least, Saigambo was defeated. This was getting bad. Gohan needed to end things once and for all. Gohan blitzed Moro, slicing him with his key claws. But Moro flipped over him and grabbed the back of his neck. Gohan was too fast, however, and threw a key construct in the form of something he lovingly referred to as a beast axe. This attack actually cut through Moro's arm. He screamed in pain, eyes red with anger and Gohan jumped back to end things once and for all. Moro pushed himself towards Gohan, but the Saiyan moved his hand in front of him. Moro thought it was gonna be a simple Ki Blast, ready to absorb it again, but his heart dropped once he heard what Gohan said. Kai Kai Moro! A beam shot towards Moro, and he started to distort and change, shrinking. This was the same attack the Grand Supreme Kai used against Moro thousands of years ago to seal him away. He was getting desperate, but it was taking too much out of Gohan to keep it up. He slowly started to blink in and out of his beast form, but Moro kept on shrinking until all that was visible was an eye. Could it be over? Gohan took one last breath as he pushed him in with all his energy, but he saw something soon past him and to Moro, the hand he had previously cut. The hand reattached itself to Moro, and while the Z fighters cursed, Gohan said he could still hold it. He could still win, but he was getting shaky. He was losing power. Suddenly, Gohan was thrown back as the little ball that was Moro grew instantly back into the full villain. His mane is long and white, unlike before. Moro cackled as he looked at the palm of his hand. Electricity flowing through him, this power. It was Gohan's power. The hand had previously touched the back of Gohan's neck, granting Moro beastly power. In a single aura explosion, Moro disintegrated a handful of his own men and the Z fighters were severely hurt if they didn't get away. Broly and Gohan, the closest to the center, were very damaged and blown away by it. Moro didn't waste any time rushing in and dragging Gohan against the ground and appearing on top of them, taking their energy. Piccolo wrapped his arms around Moro, holding him back, but Moro simply created a key sword on his hand and sliced clean through Piccolo's. Moro continued beating on Gohan while Broly tried to protect him. He needed to contain his strength he couldn't go all out, but as Moro continued to insult him, the planet, and Gohan, Broly's eyes went blank, pushing him back and slamming him against the ground, getting him in a combo he just couldn't get out of. This gave Gohan and Piccolo a chance to breathe, but they couldn't risk Broly losing complete control. But they didn't have to worry about that for long, as Broly's power slowly drained. 
he went from full power Super Saiyan back down to regular Super Saiyan. Even if Broly is stronger than Moro through the arc, Broly is one giant ball of key for Moro to take. Broly promises Gohan to keep on fighting no matter what until he's finally broken down to his base form, drained completely. Moro punches him away, with Broly rolling off towards Gohan. Moro takes slow steps towards him. Piccolo tries to stand back up and do something, but he's blasted through the chest, landing by Broly. Look at you. Just like your father, this is the end of the line. Thank you for all the power, poor Gohan. No father, no master, no friends. All alone. Gohan's not alone! A shower of Ki Blast hit Moro all at once from behind. A total rain that could have killed any lesser being. The Pride Troopers, Dispo, Topo, and Jiren arrived. They nodded Gohan, answering the call of justice was not just reserved for Universe 11. Another voice came from behind Jiren, a green Kaioshin appearing by his side. Zamazu concurred with Jiren's statement, Gohan couldn't believe he was there. Previously, Gohan stopped Beerus from killing present Zamazu and instead opted to reform him. All the fighters had learned so much from Gohan, it was time to pay it back. And at the front of everyone was his father, Goku. The fighters had received Gohan's pleas for help around the same time and arrived to help. Goku thanks Gohan for holding down the fort for so long. He knows it mustn't have been easy with all the power absorption Moro has, but it gave Goku more time to train with Miras. Gohan turned to see Miras nod at Gohan while he grabbed the hurt Z fighters out of there, including Broly and Piccolo. Now the fruits of that training could be unleashed. With a deep breath, Goku's hair changed from black into white. Goku, Jiren, and Topo and Dispo go towards Beast Moro. Gohan wants to join in, but he's way too hurt. Zamazu stops him. Slow down now. You mortals are fragile beings, and we don't want to rush to your death, do we? Zamazu places his hand over Gohan and begins to heal him. Gohan asks why Zamazu, out of all people, decided to answer the call. Zamazu says, I see now. There are some mortals that do deserve punishment. He's one of them. Goku, Ultra Instinct, and Jiren fight Mora. Goku is extremely difficult to hit and stronger than ever before. Jiren as well has gotten stronger since the last battle against Goku. Now that they can trust each other fully, their skills really show through. From the sidelines, Topo and Dispo fire attacks on Moro to allow Goku and Jiren to have openings. Even so, Moro's beast power is too much to handle. Even his aura is difficult to penetrate. He grabs Jiren by the face and slams him against Goku, ready to kill the Grey. But Dispo isn't about to let that happen. Blitz in forward and saving Jiren, landing a few blows on Moro as well. Though surprised at first, Moro finally catches onto the Pride Trooper, tripping him. But as Moro was distracted with Despo, Topo took the chance to rush at him with a Justice Flash that sent Moro spinning into the air. Whenever you'd like to join us, Gohan, you're more than welcome to. I'm all right now, and I think I know what we can do to take him down. It's all about that crystal on his forehead. Topo lands by Goku and Jiren. Moro's power explodes above them, but the warriors rush up at him, firing various blasts at the monster. They had to keep him in place. Gohan and Zamazu nod at each other. Their plan is to speed around the world as fast as possible, building up enough energy to strike Moro in the forehead. But can Zamazu keep up with Gohan's speed? Dispo chuckles. That's where he comes in. Without asking, he grabs onto Zamazu and begins running through the world by Gohan's side. Zamazu finds it disgusting to be used like this, but if this is the only choice... As long as my father and the others keep Moro in place, this should work. When I say so, Dispo, launch Zamazu. Zamazu, prepare your Keyblade. Wait, launch who? Now! Here goes my fastball special. Wait a minute, you damn mortal! I didn't agree to! Ah! Zamazu was launched at an incredible speed, pulling back his arm to create his purple Keyblade. At the same time, Gohan pulled his arm back to create his own silver blade. Goku and the others heard them incoming, easing on their key attacks and jumping back. Moro could barely see through the smoke, but he could sense something approaching him. He was angered, but it was too late as he blew the smoke away. The last thing he saw was Beast Gohan and Zamazu slicing his crystal in a giant axe. The speed was so incredible that the entire world was deafened for a few seconds. Zamazu and Gohan pant, smiling at each other as they land behind Moro. Was it over? Had they done it? There was a crack in the crystal, but he was still alive. 
They turn around to watch Moro slowly twitch in the form. What was going on? In the original story, Moro's body could not withstand Mirsa's angel power. But this Moro hadn't absorbed that power. Instead, he took a Gohan's. Therefore, he is in no need to fuse with Earth. Instead, he was using the last bit of power absorbed by 7-3, Piccolo's. Jiren yelled at everyone to stop him, rushing towards him and grabbing onto his body. But he kept on growing giant. No one could stop him. Gohan, Goku, Zamazu, Topo, and Dispo all grab onto Moro, while Jiren rushes upwards, generating enough ki to destroy Moro. But Moro's eyes flash red, and his head twitches to look at Jiren firing a ginormous mouth beam that catches the hero by surprise, decimating his clothes as he hits the ground. Jiren was severely hurt and Samazu rushed to heal him. Moro, even larger than before, moves his leg to step on them both. It seemed like they were about to die, but at the very last second, Moro couldn't move his foot down. In fact, he felt his power slowly decreasing. He screamed in anger while Goku and the others force him to fall to the ground. They look at who stopped the step. It was Vegeta. Not only that, but he was taking Moro's power. The training he did at Yardrat had paid off. Having learned forced spirit fission already in Super Saiyan Blue, he was ready to get this joke over with. Even in his giant form, Moro is still agile. Flipping back to his feet and kicking Topo away, Vegeta tells everyone that they need to hold Moro down while he takes more of his energy. They need everyone for this. Miras, from afar, tells the Z Fighters that Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta need their help. Without a second thought and having been healed, Broly, Krillin, Orange, Piccolo, Yamcha, and the others rush to Moro. Piccolo grows in size, wrapping his arms around Moro to keep him in place as everyone else lands their strongest punches on him, trying over and over to crack the crystal. Slowly, it looked like it started to break. Vegeta continues to create a ball of everyone's ki, taking more and more of Moro's as well. Moro tries to shake everyone off, but Broly and Piccolo alone could hold him down. Moro fired a mouth beam that made some of the Z fighters dissipate, becoming small once again. He sped out some blood. At least 7-3 had learned something from watching Piccolo fight. Growing larger and smaller could help him out, as he shook everyone else away. He needed to destroy them all. They didn't deserve the power they had. Gohan landed in front of Moro. All all of the Z fighters and allies around him, Goku, Vegeta, Miras, Broly, Piccolo, Jiren, Zamazu, etc. Gohan wiped some blood of his face. Vegeta said that the energy was nearly there, just a bit more. Gohan nodded at him, saying to use it when he's ready. Moro huffed and pushed himself forward. Gohan wasted no time and did the same, screaming out, Leave my planet alone! They were inches away from reaching each other, pulling back their arms. Goku looked at Vegeta. Was it ready? Come on! The last bit of key they needed came flying to the ball of key, expanding it multiple times. Who the hell did this key belong to? Vegeta had no time to question it as he launched it at Gohan. He instinctively burst into his beast state the second the ball touched him. The roar of an Ozaru echoing through the world as both beasts punched each other in the face. The roar of an Ozaru as the imagery of it appeared from Gohan. Some sort of Ki Ozaru. Goku was shook to the core. He couldn't believe it. That power was incredible. Though it disappeared soon after. Their knees weak. They fell on each other. Both completely out of power. Everyone held their breaths. Were they both gone? But Gohan slowly stood back up. Hand still in a fist. And shot it straight up to the sky in victory. Shards of Moro's crystal falling from his fist. Though they punched each other in the face, Gohan was the one to reach the crystal with all his might. Every bit of key into that punch, Moro underneath him evaporated, leaving no trace behind. Gohan had done it. He had finally won. Everyone runs to Gohan, cheering him on. Goku shoots him a thumbs up as the Pride Troopers and Zamazu smile next to him. He really was a hero. Broly lifted him up to the sky, hugging him in celebration, while Piccolo nodded at him. Margarita, the Pride Troopers' angel and the one who helped them arrive, teleported back. She didn't really understand why they wanted to help their adversaries, but it was hard to argue with Topo's sense of justice. It could get quite annoying in her opinion. The Pride Troopers promised that this was just a temporary alliance, and that next time they will meet as rivals. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Broly, and Piccolo promise to get stronger too. And Samazu as well says his goodbyes to Gohan. Gohan tells him that he's very proud of him, but Zamazu ignores this, and tells him that it's a pleasure bringing justice to mortals who deserve it. It sounded a little terrifying as Samazu made it clear that 
he still wasn't the biggest fan of the lot. And so, the day was saved by the Powerpuff... I mean the Z Fighters. Gohan looked at his fist. He was glad it was over, as that was the toughest battle of his life. It was hard to imagine there could be any more heights for him to reach. Gohan felt someone pat his back. It was his father. The two smiled at each other. He was thankful to have him there. He was happy to know that he could always count on his dad. But the sins of the father remained. An enemy lurks in the shadows. A being only a superhero could defeat. The story concludes. Next, what if Gohan went beast early? One fateful day, Goku and Vegeta answer the call for help from two unknown strangers, Oil and Maki. Goku and Vegeta leave Earth as they are on their way to face the strongest in the universe. But this is not a story we'll focus on today, as this is something only Goku and Vegeta dealt with. Instead, it has been a long time since the battles against Moro, and peace finally returned. But a storm was brewing within Gohan. His attitude had changed following the last battles for Earth. His training had been lacking, and when he did train, he was sloppy at Piccolo noticed this whenever he was with Gohan, though he dismissed it. That was until Pan approached him during training one day. Pan says that she noticed her dad acting a little strange. He often locked himself in his study for hours, and always seemed tired. What could that be? Her master agrees to check on the Saiyan. That day, Piccolo approached Gohan at his study. Papers taken out of boxes and dirty clothes filled the room. What the hell was going on here? That's when Gohan reveals that, since his last fight, he hasn't been able to use Beast Mode anymore. It was the price he had to pay in order to stop Moro, the cost of using Kai Kai Matoru. Without his power, he felt lost now. He isn't exactly sure why or how, but the only reason he was able to access it last time was because of that explosive power Vegeta collected. Could it be a mental block? A physical one? He wasn't sure, and he was too tired to think about it anymore. All he had left to do was focus on his work, support his family, and his university research. Kai Kai Matoru, as used by the Grand Kaioshin in the Moro manga, sliced a good portion of his divine power. Similarly, it sliced Gohan's beast power. Gohan's strength had defined him for so long. What was he without it? Piccolo tries to remind him that he's more than just power. He's a father, a protector of Earth, but Gohan is just too tired and even depressed to listen. Gohan looks down at the ground and tells Piccolo that he has a lot to do, so he needs to return to his research. Piccolo is left with that thought in the back of his mind. Mr. Satan and Boo, who had been visiting to take care of Pan at the time, looked at Piccolo standing at the door, wondering what that was all about as they played with Pan. Pan asked Piccolo if her dad was okay. With the Namekian shrugging, Piccolo started to walk out, but Majin Buu tapped his shoulder. Piccolo cocked an eyebrow. What did the pink blob want now? But Buu's face changed to that of the Grand Kaioshin. Piccolo perked up, nodding his head at the god. Mr. Satan screamed in shock. What the hell? Who was that? What did he do to Buu? The Grand Kaioshin ignored it for now. I fear I may know what's going on with him, Piccolo. I thought perhaps the fact that he is so much stronger than me would erase the downsides, but... What do you mean, Lord? The Kai Kai Matoru. It was an amazingly powerful technique to seal Moro away. It took me years upon years to recover from using it. Gohan wasn't left completely useless like I was, but I fear the usage of it left him exhausted, and I am unsure when he will be able to use his full power again. Piccolo stayed quiet. Was there anything he could do? Or was time the only medicine? The Grand Kaioshin suggested that it was probably better to leave him alone for now, and encourage him, as time goes on, to train more. Piccolo nodded at the Kai, as his face changed back into Boo's. Piccolo flew out of the home, as Mr. Satan continued to ask Boo what the hell happened to his face. The camera then pans across the plains of Yansubi Heights, where Piccolo resides, a small home with a large mountain nearby, which the Namekian uses to meditate. It has been peaceful for some time, time ever since the battles against Moro, and the squabble Goku and Vegeta had on Planet Serial. Gohan continued to train, though his research kept him a little busy. While Piccolo continues to train Pan, she loves spending time with his uncle, especially since he can show off that scary looking form she loves so much. Things were going well on Earth, but the next enemy was just around the corner. Piccolo shifts his eyes to watch as a blast was sent his way, his cape slightly damaged, barely dodging the attack. Who could this be now? The smoke clear in front of Piccolo, revealing the smug smile of a gray being. An alien? No. Piccolo quickly discarded that idea. He couldn't sense his key. It was an android. The android posed in response to Piccolo's realization. Yes, he was indeed the android. Gamma 2. Piccolo didn't have to wonder for long just who created him, as he wore the insignia of the Red Ribbon Army. 
We were made with the recent battles your dear Goku and Vegeta had on Earth in mind. Our power rivals theirs. Now submit, Demon King, and surrender to justice. The biggest mistake of the Red Ribbon Army was holding on to their grudge with Goku. Just because he tore apart their army as a kid doesn't mean he's the strongest nowadays. You made a big mistake by focusing your research on him alone. Gamma 2 smirked. Oh, is that right? Gamma 2 and Piccolo rushed at each other, arms pulled back. They began to clash overhead, shockwaves sweeping the ground beneath. They seemed on par with each other, but Piccolo hadn't shown off his big guns yet. It was clear something strange was going on. Gamma 2 fired another gunshot at Piccolo, which he took on head on. The Namekian pushed away the smoke caused by the blast by taking off his cape and revealing his potential unleashed state, which he obtained a long time ago. Gamma 2 whistled at the power increase. Yeah, he was no small fry already right, but you really are strong. It's getting me pumped, but I know you can go even further beyond. What? How did you? Did I say that Red Ribbon Army's research was exclusively on Goku? Sorry, I meant focused on the battles you all had on Earth. Gamma 2 gave Piccolo a cocky grin, which made the Namekian very upset. Was he really holding back that much? Fine, Piccolo would have to use his true power, transforming into his orange state. Now that's more like it, Gamma 2 thought. Piccolo appeared before Gamma, making him realize just how fast he was. Piccolo took Gamma by the face and slammed him to the ground. Gamma was surprised, but prepared for this. He fired a blast at Piccolo's face and headbutted him in the chest. Piccolo held onto him and squeezed, swinging him away. Gamma 2 may have underestimated him a bit. Give up now, what's the Red Ribbon planning? As if I'd ever tell you. Not that you'd be able to find our secret base anyways. Secret base? Gamma 1, shut him up! Right. Why the haste, sir? He's saying too much. Piccolo already knows who we are, and he's clearly taking it slow to enjoy the fight. Gamma 1 will force him to end things now. As Gamma 2 and Piccolo continued to clash, they pushed themselves to punch each other in the face, but stopped dead in their tracks as a flash of light struck Piccolo. The Namekian looked up to see another android? Come on, I had him! You're underestimating him. We need to finish him off now. He knows too much. Gamma 2 rolled his eyes, but got in a battle stance. Piccolo stretched his arms to drag them both down, but Gamma 1 yelled at the other to charge his weapon. As Piccolo dragged them down, they charged their guns and fired at Piccolo in point-blank range. Smoke covered the entire area, with some chuckles coming from Gamma 2 being the only sound. <laughs> Lame, but looks like we got him. Let's head back. No, we need to find a body first. From behind a tree, Piccolo controls his panting and breaths. He can't win against the both of them. Unlike the Gamma from the films, who were made to only match Goku and Vegeta, these had research from Piccolo and Gohan as well. Individually, they may not be as strong as either of their final forms, but together, they go beyond it. Piccolo realized this too. He can't win alone. Above that, more of them could appear if they don't find where the base is. He needed Gohan. Maybe this is what he needed as well. Piccolo took a deep breath, ripping off his arm and gently placing it on the ground as he scurried away silently without raising his key. Piccolo heard the voices of Gamma 2 and 1 as he left. Come on, cybernetic brain. If I was a body, where would I be? Uh. Gamma 2 then tripped over something as Gamma 1 went to check on him and scold him. But they looked down to realize what they tripped on. Piccolo's arm. Hmm, looks like that's all that's left of him. Mission accomplished. Piccolo was sweating bullets as he watched the Gammas disappear into the horizon. He had a plan now, and he'd need Gohan for it. Piccolo focused and regenerated his arm, leaving for Gohan's house. Once there, Piccolo scratched on the window to get Gohan's attention. The squeak made Gohan jump up from his study and open the window. Oh, why was Piccolo here? Did school leave out early? Where's Pan? Piccolo explained everything to Gohan, who seemed a little annoyed by it all. He was in the middle of a breakthrough. Did he have to deal with this now? Piccolo stared at him blankly. This Gohan is more diligent than the one in the original story, so he does want to help. He's just busy. Well, no use crying over it now. I guess the Super Saiyans will have to wait. All right. But first, I want to pick up Pan, make sure she's safe. If they knew where to find you, they'd know where to find her. Gohan insists on taking the car, as to not cause any weird looks or questions from the faculty and kids, which Piccolo hates. The two go on to pick up Pan. At the same time, in the deep, dark lair of the Red Ribbon Army, Good to see you both managed to defeat the Demon King. Now we have his arm to examine. Dr. Hito? Yeah, it's quite a curious artifact. I would love to integrate what I find into the Gammas. You mean Cell Max, right? Yeah, Cell Max. Whatever. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. 
Cell Max was on the verge of being finished. Thanks to Gohan's many ventures, they have been able to collect more data than they otherwise would have. He just needed those finishing touches. Magenta proceeded to line up with his soldiers, instructing them on kidnapping the granddaughter of Mr. Satan, Pan. A pair of soldiers agreed to go on this mission. However, when they get there, the girl isn't at school. The big soldier stepped up to the teacher, asking where the hell she went. Janet merely pointed in a general direction, terrified by the large man. Gohan was striving up front, while Pan sat in the back while Piccolo rode shotgun. He looked annoyed at having to ride when suddenly they heard a loud pop and the car spun out of control, crashing into the side and exploding. The Red Ribbon Army plane landed by it, with the soldiers walking out to investigate. The short one yelled at the tall one. Their instructions were to capture her, not fry her, but flying behind and above them, Gohan held on to Piccolo and Pan, with Piccolo pushing off Gohan slightly. So, the Red Ribbon was going after Pan after all. They descended down and tapped the tall one on the shoulder. He jumped back. Ah, ghosts! Piccolo stared at their communication devices, exploding them. Gohan and Piccolo asked where the Red Ribbon Army base was, but the short one refused to cooperate. The tall one gave in immediately. Gohan thanked them, requesting them to be taken there. But first, Gohan wanted to drop Pan off. Gohan's home may not be safe. They used the Red Ribbon plane to get to Capsule Corp and drop off Pan with Bulma. Pan insisted that she wanted to go with them. Bulma told her that they could have fun here. Pan was adamant, but Gohan kneeled down and told her that this time it was a bit too dangerous for her that she'd be safe with Bulma. He doesn't want her fighting anyone. She continues to argue until Piccolo looks at her and tells her that they can take care of things. She'll eventually be strong enough to go with them. Pan giggles. He owes her some more training if that's the case. Gohan side-eyed Piccolo. He'd been training her? In the plane, as the soldiers fly them over to the Red Ribbon base, Gohan asks Piccolo. Do you think it's a good idea to be training her? <laughs> you started even younger. I didn't have a choice. We live in times of peace. Why not let her have a childhood and be a normal girl? <laughs> you think I'm doing it for my own health? It was her idea. She has your potential and Goku's fire inside of her, and Videl's tenacity. You'd know if you were paying attention to your family. Gohan gets angry at first, a spark of electricity jolting around him, but he comes down quickly. Piccolo notices this and wonders if perhaps he just needs that push to get his power back. Gohan sighs and tells Piccolo that he recognizes he should be the one leading his daughter, but he just can't as of late. Piccolo places a hand on his shoulder, telling him that they'll get him back there. At the Red Ribbon base, Piccolo's arm was being analyzed, and Dr. Hedo discovers something surprising. The demon cells could regenerate. It was fascinating. Whoa, regenerate? You mean Piccolo may still be out there? Hedo begins to implement the regeneration capabilities into Cell Max, while Magenta yelled at the Gammas and told them to go out there. As the Gammas ran out, they heard something, an explosion from high above. They looked down from the balcony along with Magenta, only to see Gohan gently setting two soldiers down on the ground, standing tall next to Piccolo. Gamma 2 cursed. So, he was still around. The Gammas jumped down with a loud, metallic thud. The two sides stared each other down. Gohan hadn't had to fight an android in a long time. It was a little nostalgic, but no time for that. Gohan yelled out into his ultimate form, while Piccolo huffed into his own potential awakened state. Gamma 1 asked Piccolo why not use orange right away, and Piccolo said that this should be enough for now. They didn't think he would go all out on their first fight right? Gamma 2 zooms to Gohan, while Gamma 1 and Piccolo duke it out. Gamma 1 realized that Piccolo was not bluffing. This 1v1 was a lot tougher than their last match. Even so, he could still win. Gamma 2 and Gohan have a good fight. As Gohan grabs 2 by the cape, and throws him to the side, followed by a powerful Kamehameha. The Gamma recovers and activates his android barrier, deflecting the blast to the floor. But Gohan was relentless. As the Kamehameha dissipated, he rushed down to the Gamma, punching him across the face, which Gamma 2 responded by kneeing him in the stomach and kicking him to the ground. The android rushed towards Gohan, but he jumped, headbutting him in midair and grabbing him by the neck and the chest, landing a mighty suplex on the floor. Gohan panted. He was already a little winded. Seriously? He was even upset at himself. What's worse, Gamma 2 stood back up for more. Gohan rolled his eyes and got back into his defensive position. Meanwhile, back at Capsule Corp, Pan continued to annoy Bulma as she tried to do her makeup. Pan wasn't interested. It wasn't until Krillin came around
down asking about the Red Ribbon Army, where she finally gave in. She yelled out, Fine! She saw the same look in her eyes that Goku had when he was a boy long ago. There was no use trying to convince her. Boma wagered that Pan would likely go off on her own anyways. At least this way she could keep an eye on the girl. They could go see her dad, but they'll have to get some friends first. Back at the Red Pharmaceutical HQ, the battle rages on. Even with Gohan's disadvantage, he pressed on. He knew he had to win. Piccolo and Gamma 1 fought as Piccolo used telekinesis to throw chunks of buildings at him. Gamma 1 proclaimed that he'd save the world from them. Piccolo dodged the attacks, replying that he isn't the bad guy here. Together, Gohan and Piccolo rose up to the sky, firing a Kamehameha and a special beam cannon at the two. The androids were actually hit, their clothes damaged but still standing. That wasn't all they had up their sleeve, was it? Appearing down in front of them and punching them away. While recovering, Piccolo rushed in to finish them off, but Gohan stopped him. Wait, Piccolo, if they're anything like 17 and 18, maybe they aren't bad guys. Maybe they're just being manipulated. Piccolo lifted an eyebrow, turning to them and saying, You two, why do you think we're bad guys? Because you're the Demon King Piccolo, and you, we've seen you at Capsule Corp, you're in cahoots with them. We've saved the world many times, whatever Jiro has told you is wrong. Jiro, huh, you think he's back? We were bailed by Dr. Hedo under the command of Magenta. We'll stop you evildoers, here and now. Gohan heard yelling from the stairs, Magenta telling the Gammas to finish them off as he tried to get away. So that was it, huh? They wouldn't be convinced easily. The Gammas got back up and continued the fight, but Magenta was getting upset. He turned to Hedo, asking about Cell Max. Hedo said that he was almost ready to go, although the regeneration animachines were quite yet. This regeneration would be different from Cell's, as it isn't directly from Cell Max himself, but nanomachines in and on on him. Magenta yelled at Hedo to stop with the nerd talk and wake up Cell Max already. As the androids prepared to fight once more, a capsule corp ship landed nearby. With Boma, Pan, Krillin, 18, Goten, and Trunks, Magenta cursed. More of them, huh? He commanded the Red Ribbon soldiers to attack, with Carmine leading them. Instantly, the Z fighters rushed in to fight. Gohan cursed at Boma under his breath. Why had she brought Pan here? Surely she saw Goku within her just like Piccolo does, but the Z fighters were taking quick care of the Red Ribbon soldiers but some of them stopped themselves from attacking Pan. Even Goten and Trunks, they were just kids. Magenta yelled at them to stop hesitating, they're evil. Carmine pushed one of the soldiers aside as he took his gun and fired at Pan. What the hell are you doing? Goten and Trunks stopped the bullets from hitting Pan, but Carmine was relentless. Gamma 1 pushed Piccolo away and grabbed Carmine by the collar shirt, yelling at him for having done that. Upset at this reaction, Magenta yells at Hedo to make them let Carmine go and attack. I I can't let them do that. I can't have them attacking a preschooler. Magenta stepped in front of Hedo and began running to the Cell Max location. Hedo followed close behind. Gamma 1 knocked out Carmine and apologized to Pan, who giggled at him. Gamma 1 ordered Gamma 2 to stop, with Gohan thanking Dende as he was feeling pretty tired from all the fighting. Finally, it looked like they were coming to their senses. Then... There was nothing but silence. Goten and Trunks were instantly alarmed. Something was approaching. Piccolo looked surprised at Gohan as he froze in place. That energy he felt awakening. Could it be? As a thousand thoughts rushed through his head, a gigantic figure made its presence known, showing up at the scene. Goku and Vegeta, who were training at Beerus' planet, stopped their fight. They were paralyzed, feeling a monstrous energy on Earth. The Gammons instantly knew what that was, and Piccolo couldn't believe it either. The gigantic figure started to wipe every war warrior on sight. A giant tail swiping through the battlefield. Piccolo, Goten, Trunks, and even the Gammas, who were in the middle, got caught in the crossfire. But Gohan just stood there, the death and the structure around him, doing nothing, watching, feeling weak and useless. He felt like a kid again, freed. The only soul warrior doing nothing, just like when the Saiyans arrived for the first time. He could remember the yells of his master, Piccolo, screaming at him to do something. He remembered it all too well. Go on! It wasn't his memories. Piccolo screamed at him that he should do something, and he wasn't the only one asking him. As Pan screamed at him too, asking for her dad to save her, Gohan's eyes focused in. Pan was being grabbed by the giant figure. She screamed at the monster to let her go, as the monster said, No need to worry, child. I am here to save you from these evildoers. This shook Gohan to his core taking him out of a trance. He wasn't a child anymore. He was a father. Gohan instantly burst into his beast state. 
It was instinct, as he hurled himself into the fight, but he didn't care at all. Jumping into the sky and kicking the Goliath away as he grabbed his daughter and returned her to the ground safely. He alerted the group to stay back, once again propelling himself towards the monster. Goten celebrated that his brother was back, but Piccolo had his doubts. He felt his power. Alright, looks like Gohan's back in action! No, wait. This isn't a fraction of his power. Something's wrong. Could they even win this time? Gohan approached the colossal being. He was red. He was giant. But he was definitely Cell. No doubt about it whatsoever. I wasn't expecting to see you this soon. Instead of running away, you're coming right to me, son Gohan, isn't it? Gohan snapped out of it. Confused by the remark, he cautiously nodded. Cell, I don't know when or how you came back but I won't be as playful as I was last time. No one touches my daughter. Ah, but you're wrong, son Gohan. I'm not the cell you once knew, and I won't let history repeat itself. I promise you, you and all your minions won't cause any more harm to this world. Wait, what? Gohan couldn't even think of a proper response, as a punch the size of a house quickly crushed his entire body. This monster wasn't just big, he was fast. Gohan quickly started to fly around Cell, looking for an opening, but it was hard to evade his attacks. His arms were like giant, light-speed buildings. Gohan rushed towards his eyes, striking him with his leg, but would it be enough? As the giant roared, he slapped away Gohan like a mosquito, but the Saiyan's resolve didn't waver as he made a giant beast claw, slicing through Cell Max's arm, while the android covered his eye, but he wasn't able to even penetrate through the skeleton. He didn't even make him bleed. Damn, he was tough. Cell Max quickly uncovered his eye, and he launched two crimson beams from it. To him, they were just laser eyes, but to Gohan, they were giant key waves. Gohan was sliding through them, charging Amsenko, finally getting close and launching it towards Cell's face. With him barely able to dodge it, the giant threw a kick to Gohan, who saw this as an opportunity to rush towards his other leg, grabbing him with all his strength while gathering power and pushing it throwing Cell off balance and making him crash to the ground. The great earthquake was felt in the arena, and as Gohan focused in, he was caught by surprise by the giant wrecking ball crashing onto him. It was Cell Max's tail. Gohan panted, but this might be the opportunity he needed. As he sliced Cell Max's giant tail with another colossal key claw, this time it actually worked. Gohan grabbed the wrecking ball with both arms, ignoring the pain launching it at his head. It landed, smashing his face, leaving Cell Max with a broken nose. Both warriors recomposed themselves, and a new phase of the fight began. But to Gohan's surprise, Cell Max's nose simply regenerated, as did his tail, no doubt because of Piccolo's regeneration. I can see that fighting like this is useless. To Gohan's shock, Cell started to become smaller, almost as if he pulled the reverse of the Namekian gigantification, but he retained all the strength he had as a giant, more focused and contained in that smaller body. This would be very dangerous. It didn't help that, while Gohan had already most of his body torn apart, Cell just had a few marks and scratches on his face. Both rushed at each other, clashing fists, but this was the first warning sign, as Gohan felt an intense pain on his knuckles. Gohan used his other arm to slash at Cell with his key claws. But this wasn't going as expected. Cell blasted Gohan away, to which the half Saiyan spun around the blast and threw a beast axe at Cell. To the Saiyan's surprise, Cell Max caught the axe and crushed it in his hand. Gohan couldn't believe his eyes. As he recomposed himself, Gohan took the opportunity, and in the millisecond that Cell had his arms stretched, the beast appeared above Cell's head with another beast axe, aiming to the head crystal. He struck the landing as Gohan smirked, but his expression turned into frustration and fear as the beast axe fell on the ground, leaving a single scratch on Cell's crystal. Nothing else. Cell Max kicked Gohan so hard on the chest that he dropped back into base. As the bio android approached him, the Gammas both appeared in front of him, arms wide open to protect Gohan. They yelled at Cell to stop, proclaiming that Gohan isn't the villain here, that the Red Ribbon Army has been using them for their own selfish desires. They tried to kidnap a kid. Cell Max looks at the ground, with Gamma too happy, as it seems they have gone through to him. So it's true, isn't it? Yeah. See, I knew we could. It's true that you've also been brainwashed. Well then, 
I will make sure your parts are reused effectively. Hold on, I'm all for recycling, but... Selmax didn't listen. Rushing forward, his arms out, dragging both Gammas through the building by their neck. Gohan wiped some blood from his chin. Could he win? He remembered the last time this happened. Cell and his children defeating his friends, Sixteen's death. This time, he doubted there would be any new form to obtain. Was this really his peak? Gohan then heard the sound of teleportation, spinning on his heel to see Goku, Vegeta, and Broly. Stand aside, Gohan. I'll take it from here. Dad, you can't. He's too- Yeah, I can tell. He's crazy strong. Maybe we can defeat him together, but I'm just as excited as I am scared. <laughs> My body's rushing with adrenaline. I gotta know how it is to fight him alone. Dad, wait! Goku didn't wait. He rushed at Cell Max, blinded with excitement. Gohan recomposed himself, trying to get near the fight zone. But Vegeta stood in the way, telling him to rest, while Broly helped him up. Goku and Cell clashed, with Goku avoiding most of the hits with his Ultra Instinct. It wasn't until the Bio Android started to raise his power level that Goku was forced to leave his attacks and go on the full defensive. Unable to counterattack, Vegeta started to walk towards the battleground. Just like they did with Gas some time ago, it seems like they would have to team up. Goku yells at Vegeta to back off, that Cell Mags was beyond his league. But Vegeta just smirked. He looked at Gohan in the eye and said no words. As a dark, somber aura started to engulf him, the feeling of dread invaded Gohan's body. Danger. Destruction. In this bright purple light, Vegeta unleashed this new form, Ultra Ego, finally rivaling Goku and Gohan. But would it be enough to defeat Cell? Broly placed Gohan against the wall to rest, as he too joined the fight. Cell laughed, as he saw all three faded Saiyans before him. This was going to be fun. So, they had allied themselves with the destructive Broly, huh? Truly. They were the worst of villains. Broly started to increase his energy drastically, until his aura burst, blinding everyone. With golden hair and eyes, Broly had unleashed his ratful Super Saiyan form. This wasn't his full power, but it was his strongest form before he started to lose consciousness. Give up now, Cell! You can't beat us all at once! You Sinister Three, no matter how many you are, by the end of the day, my hammer of justice shall stop you. Oh! Wait, what? Cell Max rushed towards the warriors as Goku evaded the incoming attacks. Broly and Vegeta unleashed a beam towards Cell Max. The android stopped his course, turned around, and tanked the combined beam. As the dust settled, only a few scratches could be seen on his bio armor. The four warriors collided in the sky in a show of shockwaves and lights. It was truly something impressive, but the Saiyans didn't seem to have the upper hand. As Cell tanked the hits and delivered powerful attacks, Gohan, limping, started walking towards the battleground, but Piccolo stopped him, saying that he shouldn't keep fighting. Let me do this, Piccolo! I have to fight with them! You've got no power left! You can't fight him without that white-haired state! Goten and Trunks listened in, looked at each other, and nodded. Goten chimed in into the conversation by saying that Bulma's got the Dragon Balls at home. The two of them can go get them and use them to wish for Gohan's power to be restored. Gohan thought about it for a second, unsure if it would work, but he agreed it was their best option, even if he did only get a portion of his power back. The two kids cheered, running back and grabbing Bulma along the way, as she yelled that they weren't about to take her wishes, right? Goten asked Trunks, why she brought her, and Trunks explained that his mom is the only one that knows where she hides the Dragon Balls. The battle continued to ramp up, as Gohan powerlessly held onto Pan by Krillin's side. The bald man commented on how it was incredible where Goku and Vegeta were at now, that no one could get stronger than them. If anyone can beat Cell Max, it's them. Gohan sighed. Yeah, he hoped so, but part of him wished it could have been him to do it. He looked down at Pan. He wanted her to see him as her hero, thinking back to how she goes on and on about Grandpa Goku and Uncle Piccolo. Meanwhile, at Capsule Corp, Goten and Trunks summon the Eternal Dragon, quickly explaining the wish. Shenron's eyes flashed red, and in the battlefield, Gohan felt an incredible surge of energy, his white aura sparking up once more, stronger than ever before. Perhaps there was still a chance. Shenron asked what the next wish was, but the kids said they didn't have time for this, jumping up to the sky and telling Bulma that she can have the rest. Bulma was left awkwardly alone with Shenron until she finally thought of a wish, firming up her but Gohan burst towards Cell Max, side by side with the other three older Saiyans. Goku was glad to see Gohan back in action, but Cell Max was undisturbed. He continued to clamor about how he will be the one to take down these villains. But Gohan chuckled. You still haven't gotten it through your head, have you? We're not the bad guys here. I can see through your lies, especially in that form. You clearly look evil. <laughs> Me? 
Look at yourself in the mirror, and don't forget who was trying to kidnap whose daughter. The explosive match picked back up, with Gohan and Cell clashing fists, while Goku and Vegeta charged a Kamehameha and a Gallic gun from behind. Gohan and Cell's punch caused an explosion, and in the confusion, Cell was grabbed by Broly and slammed down to the ground. Gamma 1 and 2 formed a cross that slides down, breaking Cell Max's guard as soon as he hit the ground. This meant Max didn't have the chance to avoid the twin blasts from Goku and Vegeta, but what he did do was activate his android barrier in the nick of time as he got back up, but as Cell laughed, he felt something touch his back. Gotcha! Gohan's Masenko at point-blank range could have defeated nearly everyone else easily, and it looked like it had for a moment. Cell Max was left in a gross, twitching state, but his regeneration made sure he wasn't out of the battle for long. The team panted. They were sure that combo could have worked. Cell Max snapped his finger with a smile. Teamwork like that certainly is a hero's best trait. If only you were heroes. Gohan facepalmed. It seemed like like their battle was never ending. Magenta asks Dr. Hedo why Cell Max doesn't just kill them on the spot, but Hedo replies that doing so wouldn't be very heroic. Cell Max will fight them until they can't keep going and then arrest them. This pisses off Magenta. As Piccolo continues to charge his most powerful Makan Kozapo ever, he overhears the discussion between the scientists and the Red Ribbon commander. Cell really did think himself as a hero, huh? Just like the Gammas. But Piccolo fears that there's no other option for now. Piccolo watches carefully for an opening as he meets meets eyes with Goku. They both knew what needed to be done here. Piccolo cocks an eyebrow, in a way of saying that he promises not to kill him this time. Goku tells the Gammas to distract Cell Max, as Vegeta and Goku zoom towards him. The Gammas fire their blasters at the monster, but Cell Max was extremely fast, firing back at such a rate that his ate through the Gammas forcing Broly and Gohan to grab them out of the way. But as Cell Max got ready for Goku and Vegeta's attack, Goku disappeared. Vegeta was still in front of him, so Cell Max had no choice but to protect himself against the prince. But Goku grabbed onto Cell Max from behind, in a full Nelson. Nowhere to run. Cell Max was finally feeling the pressure, as Vegeta punched him in the stomach, smirked, and jumped out of the way. Cell Max's eyes focused on the bright light in the horizon. Piccolo fired his Makan Kozapo. Goku knew better than to die, ducking his head as he knew Piccolo was aiming for the crown, but Goku barely manages to dodge with his Ultra Instinct the immense amount of piercing, violent energy that stemmed from Cell Max's spots. That could have really hurt him. Goku looked back to see that not only had Cell Max gotten rid of him, but he had turned just in time as to only have his arm blown away. Immediately, it regenerated, as if wires grew out. You thought that would work? <laughs> Nano Machine Son! Gohan cursed as he started towards Cell Max as well. When he heard someone yell out Piccolo's name, Pan, Goku realized that the attack coming from Cell Spots wasn't meant for him. It was aimed at Piccolo. The Namekian now laid on the floor, quickly losing consciousness. Pan kneeled by him, hugging his arm and yelling for help. Gohan's breath left him for a second. He didn't know what to do. Watching Cell Max rush forward at incredible speed, Gohan spun to try and stop him when he felt something incredible. This power was extremely similar to a power he felt as a child. The power of anger. A desire to protect others. As Cell Max reached Piccolo, he told Pan to get out of there. Pan took a step before Cell Max. The ground beneath her cracked slightly, spreading her arms open before her uncle. Cell Max pulls back the punch he was about to land on Piccolo as he tells Pan to move. This isn't a fight for a child. She'll be safe soon, and the demon will be gone. But Pan was unmoved, tears streaming down her face as her neck snapped up to look up at Cell Max. A sparkle of ghee shone around her just for a split second before it disappeared. But her eyes showed the anger and the determination of every warrior that came before her. She said that she won't let him touch Mr. Piccolo. Cell Max can't believe these villains have been brainwashed by an innocent little girl. They have stooped to a new low. But Pan says that this isn't a way a hero would act. Piccolo, her dad, her granddad, they are the most heroic people she knows. Goku laughs at Vegeta not being mentioned, but quickly shakes himself out of that and yells at Pan to get out of there. Android 18 jumps into action, attempting to grab the girl out of there, but the second she touches her shoulder, she's shocked by electricity. She stops herself, 
as she hears the two talk. Selmax says that it's no use. No one there has the power to defeat him. He will bring justice to the world. Pan says that a hero isn't one with the most power. It's anyone who tries to help someone a little bit each day, even if she is weak right now. She will defend her friends. Pan jumped up, throwing a punch at Selmax, while at the same time, Gamma Wan fired his blaster at him, while Andre 18 grabbed Pan, and Broly got Piccolo out of there. Pan looked at her hand in confusion, thinking that the explosion from Gamma 1's blaster was caused by her punch. Gammas were severely hurt and nearly out of energy. They couldn't fight for much longer, but they refused to settle down, especially after hearing Pan talk. Those same words resounded in Gohan's mind. Cell really did think himself as the hero. Maybe they can still win in a different way. Goten and Trunks finally arrive back as them two. Vegeta, Broly and the Gammas rush back to fight Cell Max. Goku was going to join them when Gohan grabbed his arm. I'll be right back. Huh? You can't leave now. Studying can wait. No, Dad, trust me. I have an idea. But with you at your full power again, we have a real chance to beat Dad. Trust me. Goku looked at the determination in Gohan's eyes and sighed. Okay. The younger Saiyan smiled, shooting him a thumbs up, grabbing Pan and Piccolo, and getting out of there. Goku takes a deep breath, thinking to himself how proud he is of Gohan as a blue light stems away from him. A key avatar covering him. Cell Max sees this and laughs. He could do that too. His body began to grow again, pushing his enemies away once more. Goku and Cell Max clash, wrestling each other. This energy was nothing Cell Max was prepared for, but he did love the thrill. As they did this, from behind, Vegeta told Broly to throw him. The bigger Saiyan didn't question it, as Broly grabbed him and chucked him to the back of Cell Max's head like a spear. Vegeta flashed into Ultra Ego once more, his hands full of a twin burst cannon. As he reached the head crystal, he unleashed it. This time, it actually caused a crack on it, but Cell Max swung his tail immediately, hitting Vegeta and slamming him onto the floor, breaking some bones. The kids stopped the tail from hitting him again by catching it and slowing it down, but they too were thrown about. Krillin and Android 18 did what they could to support the rest, but slowly their numbers were falling. Though it seemed Goku is overpowering Cell Max, the android fired a mouth beam that forced Goku back onto the defensive. It couldn't reach Goku within. Gohan arrived at his home, having left Piccolo with Dende to heal him. A chest wound like that couldn't be easily fixed. Pan ran to her mother, hugging her tightly. Videl asked what the hell was going on, but Gohan didn't answer that question. Instead, he asked one of his own. Honey, where is my super suit? As Broly watches Goku slowly losing ground, he realizes he needs to do something drastic. This could be dangerous, but he needed to control his full power state, just like Whis and the others had been trying to help him do. He begins to power up, his muscles bulging up even more. This makes Cell Max shift his eyes to him for a moment. Broly roared, flying up to the Avatar's face and firing his own mouth beam at Cell. But Broly was losing control. Vegeta and the rest could tell. Broly's thoughts were filled with uncontrollable darkness and rage. Vegeta, in this damaged state, yells at Broly to calm down, that they can't afford to have another battle even if they do defeat Cell Max. Goten and Trunks cheered him on. Goku, whose energy was coming to an end, approached Broly within the avatar as it disappeared. He placed a hand on Broly's shoulder, using him as support, but also telling him that he can do this, that he can control it. Broly was trying to find that light in the darkness, to control his power, the serenity he needed. He thought of his newfound family of Shilai, Lemo, Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, and the others, and how much things have changed since then, and how he wishes to protect them. But then, Cell Max clapped his hands, crushing Broly and Goku within them. The impact was such that it caused a shockwave around the area, deafening the hero. Cell Max cocked an eyebrow as his hands began to move away from each other, a green aura sparking up from within. In a circle, within it, Broly and Goku helped support each other up. Broly's aura was forcing Cell Max's hands away from each other, but this time, Cell Max noticed Broly had his pupils. Broly roared once more, finally snapping. This made Cell Max take a step back as Broly instantly flew up to his face and exploded his aura. Cell Max was sent flying back into the side of the Red Ribbon Army building. Cell Max began to create a giant energy sphere, which quickly grew in size and suddenly became small again, that condensed energy twitching in his hand. 
Gamatu yelled out that if they are not going to stop him, then he will. It was a fun ride, but this is the only way he sees Earth surviving. Gamma One called him a fool, that he can't do this. There has to be another way. Broly and Goku began to charge a Kamehameha and an Omega Blaster together as Vegeta joined them, even though he was low in power. Gamma Two rose up to the sky. He was going to sacrifice himself, but as they were getting ready to fire, and Cell Max unleashed his energy sphere, they all saw a flash of red appear before them, stopping the sphere before they could even fire the blasts. A cape swinging in the wind, and a familiar key presence, more confident than ever before. They all turned to look at him. Even Gamma Two stopped himself. No need for anyone to die, because I am here! Dr. Hedo perked up when he heard that voice. Even Cell Max did. Gamma 1 and 2 instantly joined Broly, Vegeta, and Goku, while Goten Trunks, Android 18, and Krillin rose up to support with their own blasts. Altogether, no matter how weak they were, from the smallest power level to the strongest being, they all fired their blast, pushing back the key sphere, forcing it up to the sky as it exploded in the atmosphere. Cell Max could finally see the being behind those words. Gamma 1 and 2 were left speechless. Vegeta's face looked a little more disgusted, while Broly lifted an eyebrow and Goku smiled proudly. So, he finally returned. You! It can't be! You're- The Great Saiyan Man? That's right! And I won't let any more harm come to this world, especially not from my fellow heroes! Gamma 1! Gamma 2! Care to join me? Cell Max and Dr. Hedo were in complete disbelief. If the Great Saiyan was with them, they couldn't possibly be evil, could they? That little girl was almost kidnapped. The way Magenta had been acting, even the Gammas turned. Slowly, these things have been building up in both Dr. Hedo and Cell Max's head. Perhaps they were in the wrong. Yeah, there was no doubt about it now. Cell Max turned to a small size as he zoomed forward, meeting the Great Saiyan at his stature, staring at his eyes through the visor. Maybe that guy from before was right. If he looked at himself in the mirror, he too looked like the bad guy. But he had to keep fighting, right? No matter who it was. They were in the wrong. What is he doing? Why is he attacking? Evil must be punished. In the name of justice, we will defeat you. That's what we do. We're superheroes! That's because... Let's go! This is it! Yes! Because they're superheroes. We did it! The great Saiyan spun on his heel and smiled at Cell Max. The android laid on his back. Watching as the Saiyaman reached his hand out to him, though he had his doubts, he couldn't help but admire the hope he brought to the others around him. We don't have to fight anymore! The Red Ribbon was the real army! We are on the same team! But they're going to try and destroy the world! We have to stop them! Cell Max, listen to him! Magenta's been lying to us! What the hell are you doing? Magenta grabbed a pistol and fired at Dr. Hedo, but none of the bullets reached him. Not that they would have hurt him anyways, but they were all stopped by Cell Max himself. Behind him, Gamma 1 and Gamma 2, as well as the Great Saiyan stood tall. Magenta couldn't believe it. Cell Max looked back one last time at Dr. Hedo to make sure that he was in the right, but he nodded, looking extremely happy to see the Great Saiyan. Magenta was apprehended. His reign of terror stopped. As things calmed down, they regrouped and recuperated. Cell Max, Hedo, and the Gammas approached the Great Saiyan. Hey, uh, Mr. Saiyan, I wanted to say I'm sorry for what happened, and can you sign my movie poster? Ha! Sure thing! I'm glad you all came to your senses. You were manipulated. I'm just glad it didn't get worse. If I may ask, why can you vouch for them? There are many dangers that have come to Earth which the public knows nothing about, but us, we were there for it all. The great Saiyan man removed his helmet, revealing the Saiyan beneath, the man they were trying to kill just an hour ago, Son Gohan. All their jaws hit the floor. Gohan smiled, looking up to the sky, as he heard the sound of a ship 
Pan, Videl, and Bulma had arrived to pick them up after getting a call from Vegeta that the battles had finally ended. Piccolo rode on top of the plane with a proud smile. Goku picked up Pan as they walked alongside Videl, Goten, and Piccolo to Gohan. The Sun family hugged, with Goku bringing Piccolo in for the hug as well. It was all over. They were safe. They made friends along the way, but above all, Gohan felt okay again. Out of the rut he had been in, this adventure began because of Gohan losing his beastly power in order to save the universe. Now it had returned to him, but that was not the power he needed to defeat the villain. It was his compassion and the hope he brought others. Something Pan had taught him once more. He was exhausted. Gohan placed his Saiyaman helmet on Dr. Hedo's head, telling him to keep it, as he dug through his pocket and got out a bandana and a set of sunglasses. Hedo was geeking out. The Hedo androids and the Dr himself were invited to Capsule Corp for repairs and a temporary living as they figured out a job for them. And so, a few months passed on by. We find ourselves at Mr. Satan's home, where a press conference is being held. Hedo, the Gammas, Cell Max, the Great Salmon 2, the Great Salmon X1 and X2 stand tall, but nervously behind mics. Mr. Satan continues to promise the journalists that they will begin soon. Hedo had wanted to repay the world for what he did, and truly use his intelligence for good. Alongside Mr. Satan's Satan's help, he's able to do just that. Guten and Trunks don't really care for this, but they're at least getting paid, so maybe they can finally take out some girls. But one person in particular is missing. Inside the home, Gohan stares at his new Great Saiyan helmet designed by Bulma and Hedo. He could see himself in the reflection. He couldn't believe so much had happened ever since he'd obtained that destined form. How much he'd grown. How he wouldn't be here without his friends and his family. He wasn't sure if he was ready to go out there though. He was still nervous about how his power had been affected since the battles against Moro. He could hear Mr. Satan explaining to the public how they wanted to show the world that there was nothing they couldn't overcome, thus transforming their old enemy Cell into their greatest ally. But he was clearly buying time until he stepped out. Gohan then felt something tap his shoulder. He turned his face to look at the smiling face of Pan. She giggled to her dad. What was he still doing here? And Gohan smiled back at her and looked back down to the helmet. This is what it was all for. What he had used that beast form for. Videl, Pan, Goku, Goat and Vegeta, Broly, Majin Buu, and the Grand Kai. But above all, of course, Mr. Piccolo. He was ready to give the rest of the world the same hope they all give him. Gohan stood up, putting his helmet on. You ready? Pan enthusiastically nodded as she clicked her wristwatch, causing a Great Saiyan suit to appear over her. A combination between Gohan and Videl's, the Great Saiyans zoom forward in front of the crowd, with Pan on his shoulders, waving to everyone in the audience. Videl smiles in relief. Hello everyone, the Great Saiyan here! Mr. Satan has been gracious enough to give us a chance at something great, something much bigger than us. I haven't been around much and others have taken the role of hero the world often needs. Well, with this team, we will make sure that the hero is never missing. From powerful androids, enemies turned good, and the power of youth. Because we often need hope, because sometimes there are foes who cannot be reasoned with. We will fight on the side of justice, wielding that hope as a weapon. I promise you all, we will protect the animals, the plants, and all life on the planet! Looked at his fist one final time, balling it up as he remembered all that has been lost, but finally letting go. Relaxing his hand and smiling, he turned to present everyone. I present to you, Gamma 1, 2, and 3, Cell Max! The Great Saiyaman 2! The Great Saiyaman X, 1 and 2! And finally, the Great Saiyaman Z! The crowd erupted in claps and cheers. In the back, Gohan met eyes with his father, who smiled at him. He was happy to see him happy. Gohan was doing something he could never do, but he was proud to see him do it. Chi Chi by his side cried, worried about her babies, while Piccolo stood on the streetlight, his arms crossed, nodding at his student. Even Vegeta, Bra, and Bulma were in attendance for trunks, even if Vegeta had to be dragged there. Broly was there too, in his full power state, which he had control over now. Even so, people were scared to be around him. He was ginormous. It was comical. Gohan looked back down to smile at Pan. Heroes aren't needed only when the day of fate finally comes. Heroes are needed every day, but if an enemy arrives to threaten the peace we hold dear, then they better be ready. We will be. The beast will be. The end. 
Thanks for watching everyone, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon so you never miss the best Dragon Ball what ifs out there. If you like this video then be sure to check out the playlist in the description or in the top corner filled with Dragon Ball full stories. And consider becoming a Patreon so we can get more of these out to you guys. Anyways guys, until we meet again, see ya!